Right. Uh, good afternoon to all who have joined the Medical Rehabilitation Conference organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation. Uh, as the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I welcome all of you for this conference on medical rehabilitation. Uh, we uh, finished one full day yesterday, and this is the second day of our conference. And we have lined up again three important symposia uh, and workshops for uh, this, I mean, for the second day of this uh, uh, conference. Uh, so let me, uh, our very first would be on community based rehabilitation constraints in improving CBI in Sri Lanka. And uh, uh, let me uh, uh, invite doc Dr. Uh, Shiromi Madhuge, uh, consultant community physician, uh, youth, elderly, and disabled unit of the Ministry of Health, and Dr. Naomi Senaratna, acting consultant in rehabilitation, to chair this um, webinars in symposium. Uh, Shiromi, over to you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Padma, for uh, giving this opportunity. And uh, actually, I must uh, thank uh, the president, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, and also the expert committee on re medical rehabilitation, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, for organizing this very timely, important uh, conference. Actually, as we all know, that uh, this community-based rehabilitation is a community action to ensure that the people with disabilities uh, to have their rights same as the other uh, communities in the uh, other population in the community. So uh, keeping this remark, and I also welcome my co-chair as well. So we will, uh, without spending much time, we will uh, start the conference with uh, the title Community-Based Rehabilitation Constraints in Improving CBI in Sri Lanka. So uh, we have three expert speakers today lined up and uh, each speaker will be given 20 minutes. And uh, once all three speakers have expressed their views, we will have a Q&A session. So uh, I would uh, like to take this opportunity to invite uh, Dr. Samita Samanmali as our uh, first speaker to speak on uh, CBR in Sri Lanka, patient's point of view. Over to you, Samita. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association to choose this topic to talk in rehabilitation conference. Good afternoon. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association to choose this topic to talk in rehabilitation conference. Uh, so what is uh, community-based rehabilitation? Community-based rehabilitation uh, is not a new concept. It's a bit old one. Uh, when, I, uh, when I was asked to do a presentation on uh, community-based rehabilitation, uh, I wanted to know what other people who are working in healthcare field know about this topic. So I called and asked a few of my friends who are working in a healthcare field, but not directly related to the rehabilitation. Honestly, majority were unaware about it. They have heard the word, but they don't know uh, what exactly it is. Only few of them say the community-based rehabilitation is kind of a delivering uh, rehabilitation services to people with disabilities in their own communities. The initial concept of uh, community-based rehabilitation is like that. Uh, CBR uh, emerged in the uh, 1970s uh, with the intention to deliver low-cost rehabilitation services, uh, particularly 
uh, for the disabled people living in developing countries. It was uh, first mentioned in 1978 in WHO Alma Ata Declaration. Uh, however, this uh, concept uh, was being discussed among expertise uh, over uh, several years and added uh, several ideas onto it. And in 2003, uh, WHO expanded this concept. Um, apart from uh, healthcare and rehabilitation, WHO included uh, community development for rehabilitation, uh, equalization of opportunities, power reduction, and social inclusion of uh, people with disability. Uh, with the collaboration of uh, other international organizations, WHO developed a community-based rehabilitation guideline in 2004. So the community-based rehabilitation is a community development strategy that aims to uh, enhance the quality of life of persons with disabilities within their community. The community-based activities are designed to meet basic needs of people with disability poverty reduction, enable access to health, education and employment opportunities, social inclusion of all the people with disabilities. Um, actually, uh, community-based uh, rehabilitation activities cannot do alone. It needs a combined effort of uh, people with disability, uh, their families, uh, their communities, and uh, relevant government and non-government organization. Uh, my personal experiences on community-based rehabilitation, uh, uh, I think my personal experiences could be uh, different than general person with disability in Sri Lanka because uh, I am a privileged person with a disability. I'm working in medical field, so I have fairly access to medical services except physical barriers. I have basic medical knowledge, so I know uh, about my condition and uh, secondary complications that can be occur in future and how to prevent them. So uh, general experiences of uh, people with disability are not like that. But I have friends with uh, disability and I'm working with them. Therefore, I have a good knowledge of their general experiences of community-based rehabilitation. Why we need community-based rehabilitation? This photo was seen by one of my friends. Uh, this patient has fallen from a tree and uh, he had a spinal cord injury uh, in thoracic level. But he had not received uh, institutional rehabilitation. He has gone for alternative treatment. He was from uh, uh, poor socioeconomic background, uh, with uh, poor family support, with uh, low education. After a few years of his injury, he had uh, developed uh, pressure ulcers and uh, repeated surgeries were done, but uh, the wound was not healed. Uh, when he presented at last time, that means uh, two years ago, he presented with very bad uh, pressure ulcers. You can see how deep it is. Uh, the wound was uh, extend, extended uh, into his bowel and bladder and he had osteomyelitis, contractures. Uh, they have done the surgery but they could not uh, save his life. He died after a few weeks. The second patient, uh, he's from uh, uh, Norelia. Uh, he's uh, he's in 20s. Uh, he had uh, injury in construction site. He also had uh, he also has uh, spinal cord injury. Mm. He had received uh, institutional rehabilitation. He was in a Ragama Rehabilitation Hospital in 2020. I mean last year, and he also from a poor socioeconomic background. Uh, he did not have uh, good family support. A uh, few months after he discharged from hospital, he had developed uh, pressure ulcers. Uh, he has tried to uh, dressing wound at home because he he said he could not afford uh, 
cost of transport to travel the hospital. Mm, but ultimately, a wound was infected. It was very bad. And the uh, surgeon decided to bilateral amputation. So uh, what are these two cases telling us? One had received institutional rehabilitation, other one had not. But both of them had developed easily preventable secondary complication. Why these are happening? Patients are not coming back to our clinics. Unavailability of accessible public transport and they cannot afford private transport due to financial difficulties. Lack of knowledge in peripheral hospital health staff on secondary complication of some disabilities. And we don't have well-established community-based rehabilitation program to provide health care for people with disabilities in community level. As a person with a disability, this is the way I see the community-based rehabilitation. I see community-based rehabilitation is like teach how to fishing instead of giving a fish to a person every day. It's kind of an empowerment. When I call my friends to check their knowledge on community-based rehabilitation, they ask this question. Actually, do we have a community-based rehabilitation program? Yes, we do have a handful of community-based rehabilitation program. As an example, uh, community-based rehabilitation program uh, running by uh, social service department and uh, NGOs uh, like uh, uh, Navajivan, a Women's Development Center, and Handicap International. They're also uh, doing uh, community-based rehabilitation in a selected area. Um, the speaker from uh, Social Service Ministry uh, will talk about the community-based rehabilitation program conducted by Department of Social Services. And uh, the Navajivan uh, is a rehabilitation NGO uh, based on Tangol. Um, they had a fairly good uh, community-based rehabilitation program uh, in selected areas. And um, so what are the issues in uh, community-based rehabilitation program? Um, these community-based rehabilitation programs uh, are isolated not interconnected, they are working alone and uh, they address a particular part of community-based rehabilitation as an example, some are uh, su uh, giving support for employment, some are uh, support for education, uh, some are support uh, and some are providing uh, assistive devices. And uh, other thing is uh, we can't uh, ensure the sustainability of the program uh, conducted by NGOs because uh, they are mainly depend on donation and international fundings. And the other thing is uh, um, lack of collaboration between government and non-government organization and uh, addressing the health of people with disabilities in community-based rehabilitation is not satisfactory in Sri Lanka. Health is a fundamental. Uh, health is a fundamental human right of any person. I think uh, in community-based rehabilitation, health has a major role to play. Um, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, has proposed a very impressive community-based rehabilitation model in uh, 2014 uh, in the National Rehabilitation Guideline. All these details uh, are taken from the National Guideline for Rehabilitation. According to the model, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, will work together with the Ministry of Social Services and other sector related to uh, community-based rehabilitation. 
and uh, they have proposed uh, uh, post AMOH, Additional Medical Officer of Health in Disability, and uh, Community Rehabilitation Team. The Community Rehabilitation uh, will be led by the Additional AMOH in Disability. The members of a uh, community rehabilitation uh, team will include uh, individuals with uh, disability, family members and caregivers, physiotherapists, occupational therapist, uh, rehabilitation uh, team, and uh, primary health care team, peer and peer support, communities, um, community-based rehabilitation personnel. According to the uh, community rehabilitation model, uh, when uh, interdisciplinary rehabilitation team decide to discharge the patient after completion of their rehabilitation process, uh, they will inform uh, AMOH in disability in a particular area where the patient is living. Uh, they use a disability notification registry. It's like a, a communic communicable disease notification system. And uh, under the supervision of AMOH uh, in disability, community rehabilitation will assess the patient uh, and make necessary arrangements and direct the patient to relevant uh, services according to the patient's requirement. So uh, in this model, the health, social service and other relevant sectors are working together to improve the quality of life of people with disability while living in the community. So. Uh, if the, uh, if the Ministry of uh, Health can implement this model, I think uh, this model would be a very practical and sustainable model because uh, it will be very easy because we have already well established a public health care system in grassroots level. Uh, so we can easily implement the community based rehabilitation model. Uh, so I would like to discuss uh, opportunities in education, employment and uh, social participation in Sri Lanka with my experiences. Opportunities in education, um, actually opportunities in primary and secondary education for children with disabilities are not yet satisfactory. Uh, there are several cases were reported uh, uh, that uh, some children with disabilities are excluded from primary and secondary education in Sri Lanka. Even though the world is going towards the inclusive education, but Sri Lanka is still lagging behind it. So why we are talking about inclusive education? It gives opportunities to children with disabilities to learn how to cope in typical society. And they will learn from uh, non-disabled children. And on the other hand, uh, for the children without disabilities, inclusive education will give the opportunity to learn them how to accept individual differences, individual people with differences. Uh, when we talk about uh, tertiary level education, uh, when compared to 10 years ago uh, when I was in university, there are positive changes have been occurred in tertiary level uh, education system. Uh, most university, uh, universities have a range of supportive system for students with disabilities. I have heard that uh, Colombo, Kalania, Javadhanapura, Peradhaniya University already have a supportive system for people, with, uh, students with disabilities. And they have disability support centers. Uh, they are making uh, accessibility and providing accessible reading materials, special for uh, students with disabilities and they are arranging some financial support for uh, students with uh, uh, disabilities. <clears throat> I have to acknowledge here uh, the support which is given by Faculty of Medicine, Colombo and Postgraduate Institute of Medicine uh, to complete my bachelor degree, postgraduate degree. So <clears throat> when I had injury, uh, Faculty of Medicine gave the, their fullest support. <clears throat> So, uh, opportunities in employment in Sri Lanka. Uh, what are the programs for people with disabilities uh, to promote uh, employment opportunities? There are vocational training centers uh, running by social service uh, ministry. 
uh, and there are vocational training programs conducted by some NGOs. And there is another organization, Employees Federation. Uh, there is a, uh, Employee, Employee Federation is a private organization and there is a specialized training and disability resource center. What they are doing is uh, they are doing training programs, uh, especially IT training programs, and they connect employers and uh, suitable applicants with uh, disability. What are the issues in uh, employment opportunities in Sri Lanka? There are lack of job opportunities for people with disability. In 1988, the Ministry of Public Health Administration has issued a circular on employment of people with disabilities. According to that, uh, they, they are receiving 3% of uh, job opportunities in government sector. In 2004, this quota was extended uh, into private and uh, semi-government sector. But uh, uh, the implementation of this circular is questionable. Another thing is uh, women with uh, disabilities are more discriminated in uh, employment. And uh, there are some private companies like Mass Holdings, Brandix, uh, and uh, Standard Chartered Bank. They are offering job opportunities for uh, people with disabilities, but the main barrier is the lack of IT knowledge and lack of language skill. It is the biggest barrier to get a good opportunity in private sector for people with disability. So I think uh, we should uh, address these uh, gaps in uh, vocational training rehabilitation program and we have to prepare the people with disabilities to complete to compete uh, in competitive job market. Participation in uh, social activities. So any kind of activities which brings uh, community members together, we are called social activities. Um, it could be a religious activity, it could be a leisure activity, or it could be a sport activity, or it could be a fun activity. The, the main barriers uh, for social participation is uh, lack of accessibility. Um, do you know about accessibility law in uh, Sri Lanka? In 2006, uh, minimum accessibility standard in Sri Lanka are speci specified in accessibility regulation. But these accessibility standards were not implemented properly. So in 2012, in uh, Supreme Court has ordered to implement the accessibility regulation to all the public buildings by 2014. However, it did not happen yet. And here I have to mention the person named uh, Dr. Ajit Pereira, who fought for this law for several years. So we have law now. The, all the credit should go to Dr. Ajit Pereira. Even though we have a law, uh, people do not follow the accessibility standard in building public places. So therefore, it is very hard to find accessible building for wheelchair user, even in a Colombo city. Negative attitudes also the biggest barrier to uh, limit participation in social activities of uh, people with disabilities. Uh, negative, atti negative attitudes uh, among people with disability or uh, negative attitudes in community, or negative attitudes, uh, people who are in top level position, which have power and authority to make the changes in the society. So all these negative atti attitudes are contributed to limitation of social participation of people with disability. So currently we have a very few number of community-based rehabilitation program. Uh, community-based rehabilitation is an unmet need of uh, people with disability. So we need well-planned, sustainable community-based rehabilitation programs. Uh, so well-planned, uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable community-based rehabilitation program need national level support through policy, 
uh, and coordination of <coughs> coordination and resource allocation. Actually, we have policies and guidelines, but most of them are still in paper. And uh, the thing is a collaboration of all sectors, government and non-government organization. And uh, CBR program should be right-based approach, not charity-based approach. Another thing is the willingness of the community to respond to the needs of their members with disability. At last, but not least, having positive attitudes. Actually, all four points mainly depend on the last point, having positive attitude. As a person with a dis disability, we have been talking about these issues for several years but changes are happening in very, very, very slowly. So this is time to act. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samita. I think uh, you have expressed very important points uh, related to CBR. Uh, especially with the importance, issues and opportunities and everything as a broad categories. And also, uh, I think you are blessed with different aspects because you are now working as a medical officer attached to the Raghama Rehabilitation Hospital as well. So you come across a lot of uh, opportunities as well with your expert knowledge, uh, sharing all the views. Uh, we appreciate it and thank you very much. And also, uh, uh, I would like to hand over uh, my co-chair, Dr. Naomi, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shirobi. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Samita, again for that excellent presentation. You have highlighted the important concepts of uh, community-based rehabilitation. Next, uh, again, an interesting topic. Uh, available amenities and constraints in improving community-based rehabilitation in Sri Lanka will be presented by Mr. Chandana Ranavirarachi, Director of Department of Social Services. Over to you, Mr. Chandana. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chandana Ranavirarachi, Director, Department of Social Services. So I'd like to present the intervention of the Department of Social Services for patients uh, welfare services, especially in uh, community-based rehabilitation. Uh, and uh, uh, first uh, intervention of the uh, patient welfare services in Sri Lanka. Uh, so uh, according to the request made by Dr. Narendra Pintu, uh, orthopedic surgeon, Sri Lanka spinal cord networking, uh, in the year 2014, from the Department of Social Services to provide the services of a social services officers to the spinal cord accident uh, special unit uh, at Colombo National Hospital. The request has been uh, fulfilled by the Department of Social Services. Uh, at present, most of the major uh, hospitals uh, in the country have appointed uh, officers on full-time and short-term basis as a uh, continuation of the uh, work. Uh, during the, uh, the, the recent past, uh, there has been a gradual uh, opening of the of to carry out social intervention in the health sector, leading a new way in perfect uh, medical intervention made for patient in the health sector. The following uh, diagrams will help to get an idea uh, in this connection. Uh, it is uh, clear from this diagram that uh, with medical intervention in the event of an accident or illness uh, to a person, the social intervention begins and when uh, medical intervention gradually decreases according to the uh, prevailing conditions over time. The social intervention gradually reaches uh, to the maximum level. So let's next we see the why social intervention is uh, important. Uh, the opinion of various uh, 
professionals in the field of health was that the social intervention is very important uh, in achieving patients' well-being. As a result of this, the necessity of uh, scientific uh, intervention of a certain party to explore the uh, matters such as especially uh, the patient mental balance, uh, medications, uh, therapeutic methods, families, economic balance, basic problems in the family, the basic problems that need to be solved at home, uh, and also the equipment which are required, uh, and the, uh, the access facilities of the uh, disabled persons. Uh, now we'll move to the, uh, the welfare services provided by the social service officers in the hospital. Uh, in here, uh, the welfare services provided in the hospitals are mainly divided into two parts. The first one is uh, performing the welfare services within the hospitals for patients uh, who are being treated in hospitals. Uh, in here, the services to be carried out by the social services division for the, uh, the problems and needs of the patient that arise during the case conference or daily ward rounds conducted by the rehabilitation team uh, for an uh, inpatient are delivered to the patient and the relevant rehabilitation team. Uh, and also if, what, if, if it was decided to send the patient to home from the hospital at any time, the social services officer coordinates the uh, provisions of common, common toilets uh, and uh, wheelchairs uh, and access facilities as well as the economic development of his family and uh, education fa uh, facilities of the children as well as external facilities and knowledge required for the patient uh, to be socialized. Uh, and the officer carries out the further explaining of medical advice to the patient and his family member about his illness or disability in the event of an accident or hospitalization of persons and the coordination of the related services at the special occasions. Also in such cases, an information, uh, an information report uh, is prepared for the patient for use in future rehabilitation plans also. The second one is coordinating of welfare services with the social services officers of the relevant divisional secretariat for the patients who are discharged from the hospital. Uh, in relation to the above matter, doctors and uh, therapists advise the patient to use the uh, prosthetic foot, crutches, uh, wheelchairs, and other assistive devices. Uh, when a patient leaves the hospital, uh, in such cases, arrangements are uh, been made by the social services officers of the relevant hospital to meet uh, those needs as much as possible by contacting the relevant persons, uh, individual persons, institutions, organizations, uh, the donor committee, communities, likewise. Uh, the more, most important thing that happened, that's the great effort of the social services officer to deliver this equipment or services to the patients uh, home or no before leaving the hospital. Uh, the social services officers with the uh, following matters are also uh, engaging uh, very e effectively. Uh, providing vocational training facilities for the target groups. So under the social services department, uh, we have uh, eight uh, vocational training uh, centers throughout the country and annually uh, we can uh, we, we recruited uh, roughly 550 uh, students of uh, those uh, vocational training centers. And as you know, we have uh, a vocational training center in the uh, premises of the Ragama uh, teaching hospitals and also uh, reaching the carry opportunities and counseling uh, that is one of the main important things. Uh, intervening issues occurred with employers. Uh, also make uh, contact with the Department of Labor if needed. 
coordination on uh, providing compensation uh, and also making aware of family members and the community about disabilities. So that is one of the most, most important thing. Uh, referring for legal aid services if needed uh, and also maintain and strengthen the organization for the person with disabilities. Uh, and also provide the uh, housing and other facilities for the uh, relevant persons under the CBR program. Uh, also, uh, bringing the problems of the persons with the disabilities to the national level, because we have the, uh, the program at the uh, rural level, uh, divisional secretariat level, uh, district level, and the national level. And also the support capabilities of the persons with disabilities to the national level, so annually we organize the uh, the sport uh, uh, event, uh, national national events. Uh, but because of the uh, COVID situation, we are unable to organize that event in last year and this year. Uh, and also the uh, uh, the cultural abilities of the person with disabilities to the national level. So we annually conduct the, the sit through uh, cultural event. Uh, and also making aware of the health staff on social services activities, uh, supporting uh, for the establishment of organizations of uh, uh, patients uh, and introduce, introduce, introducing of the music therapy programs, making aware of public officers on social service activities, uh, participating in national and international conferences, Interagency coordinations, uh, that is one of the most important parts. So we have to coordinate with the, uh, the provincial council also. Uh, providing knowledge on disability prevention program and first aid uh, to target uh, targeted groups. And next I move to the welfare cycle of the social services. Hmm? Uh, so uh, according to the welfare cycles, the Welfare activities uh, comes from the instant of persons become ill or disabilities or in here in accidents. And at the end, uh, it will be able to get a rough idea on how it is done by the social service such divisions of the hospital and the social services divisions of the division secretariats uh, on various uh, interventions of the uh, treatment, uh, rehabilitation companies. And the person's back to the home and is uh, rehabilitated with his family uh, and the surrounding community until he recovers from illnesses, disability, and adapts to the normal lifestyle. Also, working as a team of the medical staff, nursing staff, therapists, social workers, attendants, as well as patients. And even their uh, caregivers for all these purposes will be very helpful for success of patients' welfare services. Especially such a scientific and complex process cannot be performed by a single officer, and it should be uh, the dynamic of a well-organized team. Uh, uh, the direct uh, relationships uh, are being maintained at the hospital level as well as the rural and regional level among the following parties in providing patients welfare services by social services officers, uh, sick persons, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, and hospital staff especially, uh, clients, family members. So we have to educate them, we have to aware them, uh, caregivers, friends, and rural community groups and organizations and also other field officers and the officers including in the social services officer uh, of the divisional secretariat, uh, example, technical officer. So when we need to uh, construct uh, coma toilets or provide the access facilities, uh, so we have to get the help of the technical officers of the divisional secretariat. Uh, and also the Gramanil diary, uh, donor, uh, agencies, rural development societies, sports club, children's club, uh, Sosakti group, uh, the persons with disabilities. Uh, Sosakti, uh, Sosakti is the one of the, the main organization, uh, the one of the key uh, arm of the Department of Social Services established uh, in the divisional secretariat level. 
and other uh, leading government organizations, uh, especially the National Secretariat for the Persons with Disabilities. Now it does not come under the, the Ministry of Health or the under the Department of Social Services. So we have the National Secretariat for the Persons with Disabilities, which is, uh, the, uh, belongs to the, the other ministry. Uh, anyway, we work with the we work with very closely, and our social services officers are work for that the national secretariat for the persons with disabilities, and relevant uh, provincial councils, education ministry, uh, regional health officers, labor department, and uh, the provincial councils because uh, the social services is the uh, is uh, the subject is not belong to, or sol solely belong to the um, central government. Uh, it is the uh, it's belong to the uh, provincial council also. So the social service officers, so they have uh, provincial service social service officers and the central government uh, social service officers in the division secretariat too. So we have to collaborate with them, and uh, the provincial council also provides some facilities for the patients, and they they also have the, some kind of uh, CBR programs uh, with the disabled people. So those are the challenges uh, faced by the social service officers uh, as well as the fulfilling their welfare role. Uh, the lack of finance, the social service department also, the lack of uh, financial or the other resources required in carrying out emergency patient scheme. As you know, the, uh, because of the uh, constraint of uh, um, funds or allocation, uh, of the social services department. It's very difficult to uh, fulfill the, all the requirement of the uh, request. Uh, and also at that time, our, the officers coordinate with uh, provincial council and the individual donors, NGOs, donor organizations, and according to their capacity, they have to organize that kind of things. And also we are unable to provide uh, those equipments on time because of the, uh, the some the constraints uh, we have to follow the uh, uh, procurement guidelines likewise uh, and weaknesses occur in interagency interperson relationship at certain uh, instances also failure to uh, establish the appropriate centralized system to provide proper services and problems remained with uh, updating of knowledge uh, and also lack of proper awareness of some hospital authorities on patients' welfare services provided by the social services officers. So that is one of the main constraints uh, that we have. Uh, Sometimes uh, there, there, are, there are no proper coordination with uh, hospital authorities and the, the social service uh, officers and the social services officers and the divisions. So it should be strength that coordination and they have to aware about the officers and they have to uh, work very closely. Uh, and lack of uh, basic facilities, at least for social service officers in certain hospitals. Uh, and there are some methodological development issues also. And uh, as a department, we have the strength uh, and we, ha we have uh, roughly uh, for 450 social services officers throughout the country. And we um, attach 21 officers to the hospitals full-time and 17 officers for the part-time. So altogether 38 officers we attach to the, uh, the main basic hospitals, base hospitals. Uh, and also uh, the majority of the, the officers are graduates and most of them are the master degree holders and they have a vast experience, they have vast field experience regarding the uh, social works. So that is one of the, the most important thing uh, of the uh, social services officers because uh, the, our department uh, started and duties performed by the SSO, the well-being patient. So uh, as I stopped that one, uh, the, the department started CBR program in 1994. It's, uh, at that time, so we have the, so many volunteer, volunteer people to work with us. 
uh, at now it's very difficult to find the volunteers uh, from the community so we have to train the volunteer at the uh, from their family uh, and uh, they established the department of social services for the persons with disabilities and many of the services that are carried out uh, for them are conducted through this program and an amount of rupees 10 million is allocated annually for this program so we have uh, the financial constraint too uh, and also the department of uh, the social services performs a national mission to raise the living standard of the uh, dis disadvantaged and marginalized communities in the society and downing of a great opportunity to make welfare services more effective uh, by adapting modern uh, methodologies to uh, further formalize this duty by the Department of Social Services as an institution under the Minister of Health uh, and Minister of State Minister of Primary Health Care, Epidemic Control and uh, COVID Control. So uh, this is a good uh, opportunity to discuss with uh, the other health authorities and the hospitals to uh, promote uh, this service, the social services officer service in the hospital. And uh, they have the link with the divisional level. So they are the person, uh, we can use that person to, uh, to make a bridge between the hospital and the, uh, the community rehabilitation. So before I conclude my presentation, I would like to thank Dr. Padma Gururatna uh, to give this opportunity to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chandana. I think uh, the information provided by you about the, uh, the project and the community-based rehab programs that your institution is currently conducting would be very important information for the uh, audience. And uh, uh, yeah, we know that uh, the, with the limited resources and financial supports, you are doing great job. And uh, we'll have a few questions and interesting uh, chats uh, going in the chat box. Uh, we will keep them to take at the end of the session. So uh, the next uh, topic, the way forward in improving community-based rehabilitation will be presented by Professor Chandani Lianage, Department of Sociology, University of Kalambo. Over to you, Prof. Uh, Chandani Lianage. Uh, okay, good afternoon. Uh... Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association for organizing this kind of uh, uh, program and also inviting me to share some of my experience while uh, working in the uh, relevant communities. Uh, so my task would be very easy now uh, because Samita and uh, Chandana already uh, prepare the uh, background uh, for me to discuss uh, the given task. Uh, so we'll focus on the way forward in improving CBR program. Uh, so this is the outline of my presentation. We'll briefly uh, talk uh, how to understand disability from different perspectives, uh, the current situation of Sri Lanka. So I'm not going to touch that because uh, the, uh, both the uh, previous speakers already clearly discussed that part and uh, uh, CBR as a driving force of rehabilitation interventions, uh, then the gaps between CBR policy and the practice at community level and way forward uh, in improving CBR program. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would like to talk a little bit, uh, what is disability? So disability is an umbrella term used to define a broad area. So uh, all the experts, uh, medical experts and all the other experts need to work together, uh, which required a kind of collaborative approach. Uh, so uh, impairment, disability and handicapped were replaced by the terms functioning activity, maybe the limitations and the participation restrictions. So these are the uh, key issues that we need to focus on. So uh, attitudes towards this, uh, people with disabilities are changing all the time and people who use wheelchairs and other special aids are seen more um, 
often and they are uh, they are gaining acceptance in their in their communities so i just started uh, studying disability uh, i think 3 decades back uh, where i noticed that uh, parents uh, attempt to hide uh, the child with disabilities even uh, among their communities so but now some improvements are there uh, but we have far away to go uh, so with regard to disability, it would be better to see the uh, different perspectives. Uh, why it is uh, important, how, how, uh, how would you define the disability? So where I will touch briefly a few uh, perspectives, the medical perspective, the social perspective, charity perspective, and finally the right-based perspective. Uh, so the medical model uh, basically consider the pain and impairment exist. This is not the fault of society, but the condition of a particular body. So that is the main focus of this medical model. And the social model, on the other hand, focus uh, looks society and explores where participation restrictions exist and works to eliminate these restrictions. So two ends. Uh, so this figure shows you the characteristics of medical model and the social model adopted from Mike Oliver. So we are clearly uh, explain the specific characteristics of each model. I'm not going to discuss all, but let us take few. So the medical model or the individual model uh, consider disability as a personal tra tragedy. But on the other hand, the social model focus on the social oppression. Then the personal problem, the other way, the social problem. Uh, this focus on individual treatment, but the social model focus on social actions. Here it is medicalized and the other way focus on self-help. Then the professional dominance, the other side, individual and collective responsibility. Expertise here, the other side experience as Samita discussed already. Then the individual identity but the social model uh, focus on the collective identity and the prejudices so so many decisions taken uh, based on prejudices assuming that they can't do that uh, they can't uh, marry they can't have uh, sex relationships they can't have children so all these are based on prejudices uh, the social model uh, focus on the discrimination and here the care, the other side, the rights, here the control, and other side focus on to, how to open the choices. They hear the policy and the other side politics, and uh, the, here the focus is individual adjustment, maybe in rehabilitation, more focus on adjustment, but the other side focus on social change. When it comes to charity model and the right-based approach, so uh, then again, uh, uh, huge differences. I'm not going to talk much about charity ap approach because that is very familiar for all of us. Uh, in this context, uh, the, the disabled body is considered as a so source of merit for the uh, able bodies. But the human rights uh, base, so that is very, very important. Uh, that is actually focused on fulfilling aimed human rights in a sensitive manner. And also the uh, individual are seen as subjects, as rights holders, as well as duty bearers in different contexts. And the responsibility, the, the national and the international law uh, and obligations um, and accountability for fulfilling rights of individuals is important. So when it comes to the Sri Lankan context, uh, Samita actually already uh, provided very comprehensive uh, overview. And Chandan also talked about uh, the, uh, the limitations so, uh, to a certain extent. So here you could see huge disparities uh, with regard to empowerment of people with disabilities as Chandana correctly pointed out, so many programs there are to uh, support them with, uh, with the material kind of things as welfare provisions, but hardly focus on empowerment aspect. Then the health and rehabilitation, education, work and employment, 
mainstream enabling environment. So there are huge gaps you can see. Uh, so I think better to mention that uh, when I was conducting a lecture at uh, the Faculty of Medicine, uh, I can't, uh, I don't know, Samita can remember, uh, you were one of the students you came to near the lecture hall, but you, uh, you bit late on that particular day, but you couldn't enter to my lecture hall until we opened the door for the tea break. So that's a good lesson still uh, is with me. Uh, so huge um, issues with regard to accessibility uh, and uh, rehabilitation uh, focus, uh, early, early detection and interventions very limited. Then the lack of assistive technologies and devices, another issue. Poor access to healthcare facilities uh, and specialized services. And I want to highlight inadequate knowledge, skills, and competency for dis disability work, even among healthcare providers. And the uh, mainstream, lot of uh, issues, uh, and the social and institutional cohesion. So a lot of gaps here because uh, uh, no implementation, coordination, monitoring and evaluation mechanisms to implement multi-sectorial approach towards disability. As I mentioned earlier, which required multi-sectorial, multidisciplinary work, but that is very much lacking in the Sri Lankan context. And uh, lack of partnership uh, among uh, state NGOs and the private sector interventions and even uh, sometimes clashes when NGOs uh, attempt to empower the persons with disabilities, uh, sometimes the, the government officers uh, see it as a challenge for them because the, when the uh, people are empowered, so they demand for good quality uh, wheelchairs or other kind of devices and uh, the accessibility to relevant office and, and so on. So some officers are not generalizing, but uh, some cases there are the officers consider uh, empowerment is, uh, is a rather challenge for them. And uh, this is the area like professional standards and ethical guidelines. So uh, with regard to CBR, uh, so which is considered as the driving force of implementing uh, the, the policy of, uh, with regard to disability. So Sri Lanka implements CBR um, uh, when it emerged as a global strategy. So we are in advance. So we are ready to accommodate all this uh, that appreciate, but uh, the, what is the aim of CBR program? It aims empowering persons with disabilities with knowledge and skills, enabling them to enjoy their rights and perform their duties and responsibilities in national development uh, in prevailing socio-economic system and creating opportunities through the social development programs. So already some achievements I acknowledge, but more efforts essential to have a, a disability inclusive society. So then how to move forward? So uh, yeah, so we can see number of gaps between uh, planned policy and what is happening at the uh, practice in the community level. Uh, so uh, strengthening CBR system has significant impact, no doubt that. However, it is significant to revisit CBR and assess its actors, the content, the process and the content. CBR policy aims to promote the rights of people with disabilities, but in implementation, predominantly adopts welfare-based strategies, reinforcing their dependency. This is a multi-ministerial, multi multi-sectoral uh, policy and action plan. So no one ministry can effectively bring other ministries together for disability work. So it lacks sufficient implementation, coordination, monitoring, uh, and evaluation mechanisms. Uh, so, uh, as Chandana pointed out, uh, social service officers, uh, they play a crucial role. However, their main task uh, is simply limited uh, to making referrals. So, they uh, 
uh, they go to each family if they come out with a child with disability. So uh, they put their hard effort uh, to make relevant referrals. Uh, but other than that, uh, so there are many things to do. So uh, I want to highlight the uh, in order to address the gaps, uh, institutional change requires. So for that, higher level national committee for disability uh, to be placed directly under higher authorities to implement the national policy and the uh, action, national action plan and also CRPD uh, because it, it required multi-sectorial efforts. So then moving towards right-based approach. So a lot of challenges, uh, institutional strategies uh, to move forward uh, the right-based approach uh, required multidisciplinary work and also capacity building uh, of service providers, particularly uh, to, uh, to uh, work as, as a team uh, and also in the service sector. Uh, so at institutional level, a lot of uh, interventions required. So I can mention one example. So the sign language interpreter uh, should be available in the clinic, in the hospital, uh, the other, other uh, uh, service provision areas. And also uh, professional standards and uh, guidelines should be there uh, in this area. Uh, and also reasonable accommodation in education, employment, uh, and everywhere. So uh, that is actually rather neglected. Uh, that is why the persons with disabilities are uh, experiencing uh, discrimination and more negative consequences and even drop out from schools and, and so on. Uh, so as Samita mentioned, strengthening partnership among government NGOs, uh, civil society organizations is very, very important. We know that the government uh, is not uh, sufficient enough to handle all these things, but the collaboration is very important. Uh, already, uh, there are a number of uh, organizations, NGOs uh, involved here uh, to provide required services. Uh, so uh, while evaluating uh, uh, activities by one of the NGOs, I came across with a lot of successful stories. So I will highlight a few. So one is uh, school enrollment. Uh, so there were occasions where the uh, schools rejected uh, to accept the, the, the ch children with disabilities. So the self-help group themselves organized uh, and uh, they appeared as a team. Uh, and um, as a result, uh, they were able to uh, get enrollment. And also some interventions regarding early childhood development. So uh, they trained uh, nursery teachers uh, to handle children with disabilities. So. Uh, the, the teachers who received that kind of um, training, they have performed very well. Uh, but what happened when the child go to school, uh, so the school teachers are not given that kind of uh, training and a lot of harassment uh, from the school. Then the, uh, it is very important uh, they focus on capacity building of self-help groups uh, through different kind of interventions, providing leadership training, providing awareness regarding different topics, uh, gender equity uh, and election rights, sexual and reproductive health. So that is one of the areas really neglected uh, when we talk about disability. Uh, and also uh, I observed uh, model centers uh, established um, uh, with the involvement of uh, NGOs and as a collaborative approach uh, with the social services also. So that is really good. Why? Because uh, so the, the persons with disabilities get uh, can access number of services in uh, under the one roof. So physiotherapists, uh, the uh, counselors, so all uh, are there in the one place. So that would be very convenient. So that should be encouraged. However, unfortunately, sustainability of those programs uh, is really a challenge because as Samita mentioned, uh, that is depend on the funds and, and, and so on. 
So promoting partnership and capacity building uh, is very important. Uh, and um, uh, for which CBR has a good structure uh, to adopt both top-down implementations and also bottom-up practices. Uh, so that structure is very good. Self-help groups functioning as a pressure group at community level, uh, but that is not sufficient. So strategies required uh, uh, to empower them. Then the uh, promoting the participation of uh, persons with disabilities, that is important. What happened at the ground level because of this uh, uh, program limited just to provide material kind of welfare assistance. Uh, so majority they are, uh, they have no access to. So they are waiting uh, till uh, they get opportunity to receive the monthly allowance. For that, they have to wait till uh, somebody uh, passed away so that that way they have to wait so uh, then the people uh, perceive it as useless attending meetings and so on so uh, if we are not getting sufficient benefits so why we are wasting time so that kind of uh, and the empowering of pwds is very important when we uh, see way forward uh, and uh, social service officers currently they are playing very important role but they are not professionally trained to address the concern issues uh, or to empower the community uh, uh, in, in relevant settings rather than uh, making referrals. So therefore, I think the human resource development is key when we talk about uh, way forward. And um, the other aspect is active promote, promote uh, activity promote right-based approach. So other approaches are there, charity approach there, and uh, many other things are there, but still we are far behind uh, with regard to uh, implementing the right-based approach. So uh, we are already uh, committed, ratified the, uh, the universal the UN the CRPD uh, and also, but uh, implementation part still very, very limited and the voice of people with disabilities being heard and listened to at all disability related uh, and uh, development work. And also uh, need to increase participation of community based in decision making related to all disability matters and attitudinal change. So uh, addressing attitudinal barriers is one of the main challenges in the Sri Lankan context. Then uh, what is first? Uh, do we wait until change the attitudes or uh, some other alternatives? So I got an opportunity to carefully observe the uh, ADA, Americans with Disability Act, how they implement it. So they focus more attention on strengthening the right-based approach rather than uh, focusing on attitudinal changes. But the outcome is very impressive when the right-based approach is very strong, uh, so attitudes will uh, disappear in slowly. Uh, so, uh, and also right-based administrative policy should enhance reasonable accommodations uh, to protect people from discrimination, uh, capacity building of self-help groups already mentioned, uh, strengthening and mobilization of disability movements so in many other countries, a lot of achievements because of the involvement of disability movement. So in our context, uh, there are a number of movements, but they have to come to a common agenda to fight against the discrimination. Uh, so disability is a cross-cutting factor that required a higher level coordination body with strong government leadership to bring disability as one of the main priorities in the mainstream development agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Chandani Lianagi for that excellent presentation. So I would like to invite uh, my co-chair, Dr. Shiromi Mahadevagi to uh, discuss the questions and interesting uh, chat in our chat. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naomi. And uh, especially, I would like to thank all three speakers first. 
and for their excellent presentations and uh, very uh, expertise overview of the subject. And also in the chat box, when we are going through, we have seen very interesting uh, uh, ideas coming up and also some questions. So as we are running short of time, I thought uh, I will uh, uh, picked up very, uh, I mean, that very uh, focused questions, what they have, uh, what our clients have asked from us. And uh, what is the coverage of CBI in Sri Lanka? I think uh, Mr. Chandana, if you can express some uh, ideas for that, would be very much uh, appreciated because uh, this is very focused. Mr. Chandana. Uh, yes, uh, normally, so as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, so we have uh, 450 social services officers throughout the country attached to the divisional secretariats and uh, hospitals. Uh, so, the, so we covered all over the country under the CBR program uh, conducted by the uh, Department of Social Services. There are no limitations. We have officers in the Northeast also. Uh, we covered uh, all the countries. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next, uh, there's a next question uh, asking that is medical sociology taught in medical schools in Sri Lanka as well as what would be the total estimated outlay to meet the needs of the disabled in the country? I think. Uh, Professor Chandani, if you can uh, express your views, that would be very much appreciated for this. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, thank you for a very interesting question. Uh, so, uh, medical sociology in the medical curriculum just started. Uh, we introduced a few courses to uh, uh, P PGIM, two courses, medical administration, MSc community medicine. Uh, where uh, the module is offered on medical sociology and medical anthropology. Uh, other than that, uh, in the uh, medical faculty and the postgraduate uh, diploma, uh, so we offer a particular module. So uh, other than that, uh, not particularly medical sociology, but in Colombo University, uh, uh, recently uh, established a particular department called uh, behavioral sciences. So that goes beyond sociology and anthropology, but focus on all the uh, behavioral sciences. So that is great achievement uh, uh, because of the involvement of Prof. Saroj and many other interested colleagues, uh, but that is not up to sufficient level. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Zilianaki. And also uh, I see Dr. Padma Gunaratna wants to uh, raise some questions. Yes, over yeah. to you. Yeah, my question is from uh, the Mr. Chandan. Now I heard the training of the social service officers. Uh, I just would like to know uh, what type of a training do they give to social service officers and whether there's an improvement, uh, room for improvement uh, uh, by, I mean, in liaising with the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Social, I mean, the Department of Social uh, services, uh, sociology uh, in the university. Uh, yes, thank you, doctor. So when we start uh, the CBR program uh, in 1994, uh, the department organized uh, 14 days, the two weeks uh, program, uh, in-house program for the, uh, about the CBR uh, activities, uh, the, the practical, activities of uh, like and then, and then after uh, it uh, that training programs reduce up to seven days and uh, three days because of the uh, the financial the constraints uh, the recently we uh, the, the department joined the new uh, the development officers and the uh, social services officers the newly recruited but they don't have any uh, training or any uh, the, the practical the experience about the CBR program. So it's very important to uh, aware the CBR program about the uh, social services officers. And also this year we uh, plan uh, to conduct the program 
to where the uh, the divisional secretariats, divisional secretaries, and the assistant divisional secretary to where the uh, the CBR program because they are the they or uh, they play the the main role uh, of the CBR program at the divisional level. Uh, but because of these constraints, uh, the, the the pandemic, so we are unable to conduct that program. Uh, and also, so we don't have the uh, the, the special program uh, conducted uh, for our officers to enhance their uh, uh, enhance their knowledge about the the and the present uh, trends and the present uh, uh, techniques about the CBR. So this is the very good uh, the, uh, platform to discuss us. us to organize that kind of workshop uh, with uh, the assistance of the health authorities. Uh, and also we have uh, provided our officers and uh, we have uh, the trained officers regarding the, uh, the CBR, the, the senior officers, so we can use those officers as a resource persons. And uh, so we will organize that kind of uh, training. Uh, that is the very important. Uh, and also doctor, so, we, we we have to organize the meeting with the health authorities to uh, the services of the social services officers in the hospitals and how to extend their uh, services uh, and also provide the good, good facilities and the recognition in the hospitals for those kind of officers because this is the as i mentioned my presentation uh, those officers are the bridge to hospital to uh, the village uh, cbr program yeah, Mr. Nandana, I just uh, thought that I would uh, let you know that this uh, having social service officers in the Ministry of Health was yeah. much earlier, even for a longer period. Uh, I think uh, uh, I came to Colombo for National Hospital in 2004, and even at that time, there was a social service officer appointed to the uh, stroke unit of the National Hospital. Uh, even uh, during uh, Mrs. Jagannathan's uh, time as the secretary. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, I mean, it, it's a matter, it, anyway, that now uh, we have been getting more and more, and uh, that has to be sort of tight, and I know that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we are running short of time, so we need to restrict the number of questions and all of you know the speakers, and then if there's any queries or any uh, questions to be clarified, you can straight away uh, speak with them later. And also, I take this opportunity on behalf of the President and the Sri Lanka Medical Council, uh, Medical Association, uh, to thank all the participants uh, and the speakers. And also, especially, we highly appreciate the work done, actually, the organizing this type of uh, conference by the uh, medical rehabilitation expert committee at the SLMA uh, for their highly timely uh, effort. And uh, thank you very much. And also those who have uh, joined with us and sharing their ideas as also uh, uh, highlighting some queries and all those things. Thank you very much. Uh, for your active participation and also a uh, special thank goes to all the, all three speakers, Dr. Samita Samanmali, Mr. Chandana Ranaviyarachi, and also Professor Chandani Lianage. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your expert thoughts with us and uh, highlighting all the needs and the challenges and all the opportunities related to CBR and also uh, the appreciation for the all uh, resource persons and uh, I mean the speakers will be sent uh, in due course. Uh, I think uh, my co-chair, do you want to uh, say a few words? Yeah, 
Thank you, Dr. Shiromi. Yes. Uh, yeah. Similarly, I would like to appreciate uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association because uh, the rehabilitation is like uh, like an advancedly evolving field in the country. So, talking about uh, the interesting topic and the, the the importance of the other elite health uh, professions and the social service uh, um, departments and their their uh, contribution to develop this uh, medical rehabilitation in the country would be very uh, important in in the future so um yes thank you for the uh, the three speakers for the excellent presentation uh, and uh, i would like to thank dr shiromu madhuge for co sharing the session with me thank you doctor. very much thank you very much okay, thank you yeah, can i start now Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the post lunch session of this uh, uh, medical rehabilitation conference uh, organized by Sri Lanka Medical Association. I am Dr. Arjuna Fernando. I am a neurologist at the National Hospital of Colombo. And together with me is my co chair, Mr. Iranga Lutke, who is the principal of the School of Physiotherapy. And uh, the first speaker for this session is. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Darshan Sisena, who is uh, currently attached to the North Colombo Medical College, uh, North, Colombo, North Colombo Teaching Hospital as consultant neurologist. And he's going to talk to us on the role of the neurologist in the rehabilitation of Parkinson's disease. Over to you, Darshan. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I should thank Dr. Padma Gunaratna, the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving this opportunity to talk about rehabilitation in Parkinson's disease, the role of neurologist. So in next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to discuss these areas. I'll give a brief introduction of what Parkinson's is. And for that, I need to discuss about symptoms and complications of Parkinsonism. And finally, the most important thing, the multidisciplinary approach to Parkinson's rehabilitation. <clears throat> you know, this is the second commonest neurodegenerative condition. So neurodegeneration means as the life goes, as we are getting age, certain number of cells in our brain and the spinal cord gets lost. So that is a normal physiological process. For some reason, which we don't know in Parkinson's, we know the pathophysiology, but we don't know what it triggers. So the, the, the number of cells which is responsible for certain functions are uh, reduced in number at a little early age than the physiological age. So this is what we call as degeneration as it's inflammation or maybe a tumor, it's one of the pathological bases. So the commonest being the Alzheimer's dementia, especially the Alzheimer's disease, the second commonest is the Parkinson's. So the most important thing is prevalent is, uh, is estimated at around 1% at the moment. So in Sri Lanka, we have about 20 to 22 million people according to the consensus, so the statistics. So we roughly see about 200,000 to 250,000 patients in the, this country. The issue is actually the World Federation of Neurology. Last year in their World Brain Day campaign, they predicted that this number is going to get doubled in 2025. So it's in five years time. So in 2025, so we are expecting double this number. So you can see the magnitude of the problem we are facing. So this condition mainly affects elderly and especially it's mentioned that's age about after 50 years. But at the moment, I'm sure Dr. Arjuna, Dr. Padma, we all know that we are seeing a lot of young patients at the moment, around 35 at the moment in our unit at Ragam. We have, I have patients, two patients, male and a female in the 30, between below the age of 40. So this is something emerging in young patients as well, younger generation as well. So when it comes to definition, there's a neurological syndrome manifested by any combination of four clinical features which are independent to each other. They are not overlapping with each other. And importantly, this deals with the motor component of the system, that is with the movements. So there are four features. One thing is, first thing is tremor at rest. So you know what tremor is. Tremor is a rhythmic oscillation of a, around a joint. So trim, it's classified as uh, either rest or action. Predominantly the Parkinson's patient has tremor at rest. So they have rigidity, which is not spasticity, which is extrapyramidal. Uh, that is called stiffness, which you call in simple terms in akinesia, but I would like to use the term bradykinesia more because kinesia means a movement, brady is slowness, so it's slowness of the movements. Finally, the most important thing which we need to access or which we need to 
no is the postural instability, which a lot of patients need rehabilitation in this aspect. If you want to remember the four cardinal features, the demonic trap you can use, T for tremor, rigidity for R for rigidity, A for echinacea, and postural instability. So I will show what I'm showing. Okay, so this patient, this patient has a very rhythmic movement around the both wrists, especially in the thumb. So which is there in the postural, but not much, especially at the right. <clears throat> so there is no intention component as well. So it's a rest remote. So this is what we call as radikinesia. So that is slowness of movements. We perform by there are certain maneuvers, what we call as repetitive alternative movements, right? You see. No, same video with. Sorry. Yeah, this is bradykinesia, the same patient. When you do the alternative movements, as is, you can very clearly see that it's not normal, very slow, especially at the amplitude gets less and less as the, the movement goes on. We do three maneuvers, the opening and closing, the finger taps and the pronation and supination movements in the upper limbs. So you see it's very slow, right? And this patient actually a football coach at St. Thomas's, which I saw about a couple of years ago. So this patient actually, so this patient, fairly advanced Parkinson's disease. So there's two postures, he's trying to catch something like that. This is what is very important. So when the patient is turned, try to turn, it's very difficult, what we call as a turn hesitancy, or sometimes we can do the freezing of gait. So very two postures are very prone to have recurrent falls. So the patient turned, this is not the normal turning, very much hesitant to do so. Something like glued to the flow. So this patient, see how she starts to initiate his walking and turn. Again, what we call as the freezing of gait. And this is when you turn and initiate to walk again, there's much what we call as initiation hesitancy with the freezing of gait. So it's the same. So see this patient also. Again, the patient is starting to walk, initiate walking, it's very difficult. The important thing you have to notice here, once they initiate the walking, this patient is not that difficult. So that's, that's something we have to address in rehabilitation. Once he starts walking, there are certain maneuvers we can do, certain tricks we could do to improve the patient's initiation of walk. See. So these patients, like what's postural balance is fairly impaired. So that's, okay, so let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is something we do in often we all do as neurologists in Parkinson's patient to assess the postural imbalance, what we call as the pull test. So we ask the patient to stand up, keep feet apart and try to make a little bit of pull over the shoulder and see whether the patient's recover. We advise the patient if he wants, he can keep a couple of steps behind. So if you can recover within a couple of steps without getting fall, speak the negative pull test. This patient's pull test is negative, but as the, uh, the disease progresses, they usually, the pull test is positive. It's very important is to assess the, the, the postural imbalance. So when it comes to disease progression, if a patient gets a, the first onset of symptoms at the age of 50, it's known according to the Bragg staging, they get the disease 20 years before that, the age of 30. Unfortunately, until they get the disease up to 50, there is no any biological marker or MRI imaging or whatever imaging which you can detect. So that is actually billions of dollars has been pushed into the research to find the pre-symptomatic patients, unfortunately, uh, not, without, not with any success at the moment. So at the moment, according to with this cartoon, you say, if here we say the patient's onset of symptoms, they usually, the average year they live is up to about seven to 20 years. So they have to live with the Parkinson's for about 20 years in average, or sometimes it's less. But the important thing is, in between, maybe around if the patient gets the disease around 50, around 60, or even a little later than, they develop the staging, they uh, little advanced disease, they tend to fall. This is where we need to catch these patients and start rehabilitation. So when it comes to rehabilitation, for whom we need to rehabilitation? In principle, all needs input from rehabilitation, but practically, you know, it is 
resources available for us, it's not possible. So how do you select the patients? We can't see, but, uh, select by looking at the face. My, so the important thing, there should be something, some staging to detect which patients need rehabilitation. There are certain tools, which I come to the next couple of slides, but important thing, when we start rehabilitation, develop a multidisciplinary team. But I mentioned what multidisciplinary team is, where each have defined roles. Each one has a defined role and to work collectively to achieve realistic goal, thereby improve the quality of life of these patients. So one of the most widely used is what we call as Hohen and Ya stage, HYN scale in short. So this has five stages. So stage one is a very mild disease. We are only unilateral. Stage two is bilateral symptoms are there. You know that when it comes to Parkinsonism, majority of the patients are idiopathic. They have a unilateral onset. So in the stage one, the strictly it's unilateral, but when it comes to stage two, it becomes uh, bilateral onset, but still the patient's uh, in, uh, the balance is very much intact. So in stage, when it comes to stage three, so mild to moderate disease, physically still independent. So stage 2.5 is stage between two and three. The important thing that comes is the pull test, still the patient can recover from the pull test. Stage four is severe disability, but still can attend to uh, stand unaided. So there is no need or there is another, another person to help us stand. Stage five is very much higher. So in this staging, according to the most of the research found the staging around stage two, 2.5, at least stage three, the patient should initiate or patient should be put into a, some sort of a rehab program. And this is what we call as PDQ39, which assess the quality of life of the patients. This is a three page questionnaire. So I'm just with the front page. So the patient is usually uh, given this uh, questionnaire to the patient and they are assessed with day-to-day -day activities. For the first question, if you can see well, they ask whether they are able to do outdoor activities, which the patient can say never, occasionally, sometimes, uh, others and always not. So like that, so you have about 39 questions in this questionnaire, patients, day-to-day -day activities we assess. And see, then we have, after when you combine these tools, which you can come to a clear idea, what's patient's problem and what sort of rehabilitation patient needs. So the next thing, complications. Now I have discussed the symptoms of, then now I'm going to discuss the complications of Parkinson's disease. So there are two main categories of complications. One thing we call as motor complications. The other one is the non-motor. So when it comes to motor, the most, uh, there are four main things. There are a lot, but I have put the most important things only. The wearing off. Simply what wearing off means, if a patient is given uh, one of that is a commonly used drug is the levodopa. We give a levodopa type that we'll see at the seven name and the next dose is scheduled at one o'clock. But at around 11.30 or 12, when reaching to the next dose, patient develops symptoms or patient getting worsening of the symptoms. So it's very predictable. So what we can assess the patient, we can increase the doses or reduce the time duration between doses. So that means increase the frequency. So that's called wearing off. The issue is sometimes these patients have very unpredictable loss, which we can't, the patient also can't say, sometimes we ask to maintain a diary, but we say the patients, today the patient's off periods are completely different from the next when it's not related to the dose frequencies or dosing schedule as well. Very difficult state. And there is another problem we call delayed on. And usually, as I mentioned in the, the, the example, if a patient gets a tablet at 7 a.m., maybe a levodopa, usually by 7, 7.30, maybe 7.45, the patient should be all right. He should be able to attain to his usual work and the symptoms are getting much, much better. But in some patients, especially when the case advanced, the patient that the, the, the initiation of getting better the symptoms with the dose doesn't happen. So what we call a delay down. Sometimes it may be you take the tablet around 7 a.m. It might be 10.30 or something like very difficult. And also it takes, it changes over the time. So this is going to do it some with the absorption of the drug. So the other thing is what we call as dyskinesia. That is a very dreadful complication, which I'll show you. There are also three times mainly the peak dose. Peak dose is... This is related to the levodopa response of the body. When a patient takes a duct, the same example I'll put at 7 a.m., 7.30, 7.45, severe dyskinesia, a severe coriform generalized movement, which lasts for about 30 to 40 minutes and goes off. The other option is end of dose. Towards as the wearing off effect, the patients develop dyskinesia towards the next dose. So it's called end of. We have to correctly identify this one because the management is totally opposite. Then there is biphasic, it's very, very difficult. We call yo-yo phenomenon. Sometimes it goes up and down, very difficult way to manage. So when it comes to non-motor symptoms, if you Google, there may be hundreds of non-motor complications, but I put the common ones. Psychosis is very common, sometimes related to drugs, sometimes related to disease itself, which are acute uh, confusional states like delirium, hallucinations, 
Okay, most of these patients known that in certain studies about more than 50% of Parkinson's patients are depressed, which is obvious, right? Sleep related issues, REM, REM sleep behavioral issues, hypersomnias, insomnias, lot of sleep related issues are with Parkinson's patients for various reasons. Dementia is quite common, especially at the late stage, which we call as Parkinson's disease dementia, which is different from the Alzheimer's. There are certain diagnostic criteria for sleep. And most of the people have fatigue. They feel very fatigue, their muscle pain and all these things. So these are the common non-motor complications. So I'll show you what dyskinesia means for those who have not seen, you can see. Severe coriform, generalized, very random. So just think about a patient who is having this dyskinesia of a whole of the day. So how dreadful and how patient is disabled on this, so it's very. So now we'll come to the third stage of my talk, the multidisciplinary approach of the in rehab. So the most important thing in the multidisciplinary approach is the patient. So there are certain individuals with certain capacities rally around the patient. So they are about, I have drawn about three, seven cycles, but depending on the facilities you have, depending on the specialties, you can have more and more circles here. So the, I have put the main ones, the neurologist saw in some countries, geriatrician plays a major role in Parkinson's rehab. So Parkinson's nurse, unfortunately, we do not have in this country, which we should initiate in the future. So she's, she or he, the Parkinson's nurse, has a very important role in coordinating the multidisciplinary team as well as communicating with the patient. So then the physiotherapist, a very important role to play, especially when it comes to the balance and other issues, falls, recurrent falls. The speech and swallowing therapies, unfortunately, there is no talk today on speech and swallowing. Very, very important because patients' communication as well as they are more prone to risk of pneumonia as another thing because of swallowing. So their aspect is very important. The occupational therapies mainly dealing with the, the, the activities of daily living, the psychologist. Because I told you there are a lot of psychological aspects, non-motor complication related to psych psychology. So there are a lot of things. So we have to have a psychiatrist or a psychologist in the team. Finally, a social worker, very important as you discussed over the the, the before sessions, I think the importance of cycle, social work is very, very important in a multidisciplinary setup. So these are the roles each one has to play. The neurologist or the geriatrician is the person who takes clinical decision when it comes to multidisciplinary regarding whether you need to change the drugs and which patient needs the, the rehabilitation input and all these things. And importantly, if there is a meeting, usually she has the meeting as there is need a leader. So Parkinson's nurse, as you learned, if it, her role is mainly some sort of, I would say, a secretariat role. So the patient, he, she, he or she, the nursing, Parkinson's nurse is the other country who completely organize all these things with the patient, with the, with the patient is getting the drugs, all these things, and lies with all the team members of the, the, the MDM multidisciplinary team. The physiotherapist, he or she has to assess and manage the risk of falls. For that, he has to have the major things. I am sure the physiotherapist will talk about is these aspects. The occupational therapist, you know that if the patient had a severe tremor, how he or she is going to the patient is going to adapt for his activities of daily living, like feeding, toileting, and all these things, which has to be assessed. Speech and swallowing therapist, assess and management communication, because these patients need to communicate with the the, the other members of the family with the society, sometimes because of the slowness, sometimes it affects the, the speech, what we call as bradyphrenia. So because, because of that very slow speech, sometimes going. so to improve the eyes. Other important thing, these patients have, uh, the, the because increased amount of salivation, sometimes they get pulled in the throat, sometimes and the food material also, they are very much prone to aspiration and later to pneumonia. So because of that, very careful assessment is needed from the speech and swallowing therapist. Psych psychologists do the assessment of non portal complications and the appropriate intervention, which could be drug related or pharmacological interventions or otherwise. The social work, as I mentioned, coordinating community rehabilitation and providing appliances. Because if a patient has difficulty in walking, they might need some sort of a uh, walking aids and others maybe will share. In this country, the social service department has lot of things to offer. Unfortunately, there is not much liaison with the, the, the social service department and the health as I think Madam, the raised question was that. So the social service worker, social worker has a very, very important role in the community rehab as well as providing certain facilities for these patients. So how does it function? So what we need to do is identify who needs multidisciplinary care. As I mentioned in my talk initially, all Parkinson's patients cannot go into rehabilitation. So which patients need and on what grounds the patient needs. So that is the, uh, we have to decide on which patients need. Then you have to have weekly, ideally it should be weekly, at least fortnight or monthly meetings in a hospital setting where all these stakeholders meet. 
and get the patient and identify each problem on these patients. So I'll come to a couple of examples here. Then you have to set practical goals. What are you going to achieve in this patient in short term? In two weeks, what are you going to do? Four weeks or in six months, what so we have to set practical goals and discuss in this team meeting. Then I have a not only setting, then you have to continuous review on these patients where they are going to achieve these things. Most important is what we always say is an actively collective effort to improve the patient's quality of life at last. So I'm going to give two small cases for this to, uh, the, 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 to explain you how this going to set up. So first patient in his age, 74 years. So each HNI stage one, you know what HNY is stage one, tremor dominant, diagnosed about a year ago, has recurrent falls. The patient has recurrent falls over the last one year, which he had, because of that, she had fracture or left humerus as well as few ribs. She's very independent, no need of walking aid, physically active activities of daily living. But the patient has multiple comorbidities. The patient is on hypertension, so having three drugs, including diuretics, severe osteoarthritis of both knee joints, depression, so because of that, she's on sertraline, and osteoporosis because of that, she's on bisphosphonate also. So think about these patients. So there are multiple multi factors, multiple factors for the patient's major problem that is recurrent falls. The Parkinsonism could be. Then medications, because the patient is on diuretic, sometimes they can have postural hypertension, so that we have to assess. Importantly, the patient has severe osteoarthritis. Fourthly, the patient is osteoporosis, very, very prone to have fractures, which already she had. And she's depressed also, which also might lead to having the, the falls. So when you consider these all these factors, we can identify the Parkinson is very stable. So no need of any change of the medications because that is not the cause of the patient's falls. Where it is probably severe osteoarthritis. So they are aware why, so though it's not a member of the rehabilitation team, you might have to go for a rheumatologist or in that means orthopedic surgeon might need to totally replacement even. So those are the decisions that is going to be taken in the MDR multidisciplinary team. The osteoporosis is a big problem. This patient already had fractures. So physiotherapist input in maintaining the, 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 the balance, the posture and the muscle strengthening is really important. The depression is a part of psychology has to assess. And the important thing when we are giving certain drugs, for example, this patient is uncertainly and sometimes they get a low sodium, these drugs can cause drowsiness. So because of that, you have to have a very clear assessment of the things and medications, as I mentioned, patient was on diuretics, so might have to go on for the washroom many times to pass urine. So that might be a reason for the fall. So we have to collectively take all, identify all these problems and come for a conclusion, what should we do? See the second patient, she's 68 years, she, he, HIN stage O, so which is diagnosed 12 years ago, at present, severe postural instability with gait difficulty, we call as a PIGD variant, postural instability, gait difficulty. You name it, all motor complications are there, which I mentioned, unpredictable loss and delayed ons, freezing of gait, biphasic dyskinesia, because of non-motor complications, they are fatigue, dementia, delirium, psychosis, on multiple medications, which are anti-Parkinson's medication, as well as antipsychotics. So if you see this patient now, her problems are due to the patients, is unable to walk at all. So there is severe Parkinsonism plus not motor and non-motor complications. So medications also pray. So mobility also major issue in this patient. How are you going to deal with in this patient is the multidisciplinary setup? So motor complications are severe wearing off. So at this moment, so probably the neurologist might have to decide the drugs are not working, the liver dope and all this not working. Sometimes it might be the cause for all the problems. It's not helping either, as well as the patients. Some of the problems, maybe the hallucinations might be drug related because we are keep on increasing the doses of uh, liver dopa, which is known to cause psychosis. So sometimes we completely take off dose adjustments. We might take off all the common medications. And sometimes in other countries, they introduce what we call as apomine infusions or some other treatment, which is not available here. So that decisions is one thing. So then hallucination and delirium. So antipsychotics and search for other cause of delirium, as I mentioned. In elderly patients, they are very common to have urinary tract infections, so hallucinations, so all these things, the delirium. So we have to look for other causes of uh, these hallucinations and the delirium. So medications has to be, as I mentioned, have to be assessed, need through assessment of all the prescribed medication. The mobility, sometimes the, 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 the team can decide this patient is no more able to walk. So the patients might need some assistance, maybe in other countries they have electric wheelchair, I'm not sure whether it's available here, so some sort of a, to maintain the mobility and activities of daily, she might, he might have to, rather than walking and having so many falls and having a lot of morbidity, maybe antibody wheelchair bound. So these are two different cases, as I mentioned. Both have Parkinson's, but their clinical problems are certainly entirely different. So we have to assess these patients 
problems initially in the individual in the patient's multidisciplinary meeting and take the necessary interventions. So I'm going to show you a small video here, which I think we also, the sound is not there. So just see, I think. Can you? So this was uh, appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine. So these are Parkinson's patient, if you can see. Barely walk, so falls, see. Now what's happening? So the patient was trained with certain rehabilitation techniques. So you could. So what we, the, 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 the doctor who was involved with this research, he wanted to train the patients with re, pro, uh, the, the peddling. So what he was, he had a friend of Parkinson's and he was this, what you call coupled one for 50 kilometers. See the patient before starting the cycling, fairly able to walk, ride anything, but see after the thing. So what? He's not the patient, right? So this is the patient. The patient is off medication. The sounds are not there. The patient is not on medication the period. So still very active. So I will, if the question and answer time is there, we'll explain the, the, the things is what they say is when the patient is trained to something else, there are a the lot of chemicals are released from the body and certain tracks, which were dormant for a long time, get activated. And see, and dancing and group physiotherapy is very important. So which is very much practiced in other countries. So you can see with the patient was ab barely able to walk now cycling. So this is the change we can do for patients with a proper rehab program. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, what I need to say, the Parkinson's patients are increasing in numbers, which we have to get ready for that. Countries like ours have very limited options in pharmacological. So for an example, we don't have any surgical facilities here, which like the other countries. So what we have is a lot of resources are there to which we can start a good rehabilitation for Parkinson's patient, which I see in the next three, four years could be make a big difference in the Parkinson's patient. What we need is a commitment. I'm sure this programs like this, and I should thank the president of the SLMA for initiating this, will open eyes for those who are not known to such. And sometimes people don't know about what we can do in Parkinson's rehab. Thank you very much. If you can ask any questions at the end of the session, I think we are taking questions we can ask or you can email me if there is anything. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Darshana, for that uh, comprehensive talk. And my co chair will introduce the next speaker. So, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Nadisha Kalyani. Uh, she's a lecturer from uh, Allied Health Science Department, Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. She will explain the role of physiotherapist in rehabilitation of Parkinson's diseases. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Nadisha Kalyani, attached to the Department of Allied Health Sciences, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. The topic for today is the role of physiotherapist in rehabilitation of Parkinson's disease. What is Parkinson's disease? As you already know, it is a chronic, progressive, incurable, complex, and disabling neurodegenerative condition. And it is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's disease. So there can be multiple environmental and genetic factors that may lead to this condition. So there are a lot of um, different clinical features associated with Parkinson's as we uh, as well as not uh, symptoms under motor symptoms there can be gait impairment bradycardia rigidity resting tremor and postural problems as non motor problems there can be cognitive dysfunction autonomic dysfunction sleep disorders and sensory abnormalities and this is and you can see this is the clinical uh, typical appearance of a Parkinson's disease patient with stooped posture, a masked facial expression, forward tilt of trunk, reduced arm swinging, and shuffling gait. 
especially as physiotherapist we uh, attend to the gait impairment of parkinson's disease uh, in usual gait cycle we have stance phase and swing phase so when looking at the spatial temporal parameters of this disease the parkinson's patients have reduced gait speed uh, such as uh, 40 to 60 meters per minute markedly uh, in increased double support time shorter stride length shorter step length however the cadence uh, which is the uh, steps per minute is intact and when looking to the kinematics uh, under joint angular motion in the stance phase there can be reduced knee flexion and extension reduced hip flexion and extension and under swing phase the reduced ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion under segmental motion the reduced arm swing transverse motion of the pelvis and thorax which is rigidly coupled trunk forward tilt increase medial lateral head motion pelvis motion and trunk motion could be noticed so as you all all know the parkinson's disease has a variety of treatment including drug therapy mainly with dopamine replacement therapy the neurosurgical interventions such as deep brain stimulation and allied health treatment which mainly involves physiotherapy okay so the key aims of physiotherapy in parkinson's disease so as physiotherapist we aim to maintain improve the function cut and improve yeah walking aids wheelchair and other aids and under tests we assess the disease severity gait balance cognition habitual physical activities and quality of life the disease severity is mainly assessed with the movement disorder society unified parkinson's disease rating scale which is a well known validated reliable scale for assessing the disease severity it has four parts the part 1 assessing the non motor aspect of experience of daily living part 2 the motor aspects of experience of daily living part 3 motor examination and part 4 motor complications this is severity is also assessed with the modified hoyn and yang staging gait and balance assessment plays a vital role there are number of tools that are used including the mini best test activity specific balance confidence scale tinetti balance and gait assessment tool and freezing of gait questionnaire these are some of the assessment which is included under assessing the balance assessing the sitting balance standing balance one leg standing balance balance assessment while standing on toes balance on a foam surface balance on an inclined plane and balance during walking the time up and go test and the dual task time up and go test is also used to measure the walking speed static and dynamic balance and mobility we ask the patient to stand walk for 3 meters turn come back and sit down this is done in normal walking and dual tasking that means asking a person to subtract numbers gait assessment is done using some advanced tool, tools as well such as gait right bat it is a pressure sensitive walkway measuring temporal and spatial parameters and providing easy assessment of gait abnormalities and 3d motion analysis system also being used uh, which cover the spatial temporal 
using treadmill training. The walking on a treadmill with speed or incline adjustments, body weight supported treadmill, and step and gait training. Dual task training is also done for Parkinson's disease patients because since their executive function is getting affected, they have issues in dual tasking. So we ask them to walk while engaged in a cognitive or manual secondary task, such as carrying a cup of water can be a manual task and subtracting numbers can be a cognitive task. The balance training, uh, there are different ways of training balance, such as exercises of self-destabilization of center of body mass involving mainly feed forward control, and then exercises of externally induced destabilization of the center of mass involving mainly feed feedback control, and exercises emphasizing coordination be between leg and arm movement during walking. Cueing techniques are also very important. There can be auditory cues, such as providing an upbeat music or a clap, then visual cues, such as pasting stickers on the ground so they have an idea where to keep their steps, and then somatosensory cues. These cues have been hypothesized to uh, bypass the disease basal ganglia by utilizing different pathways. Dance therapy has become an emerging treatment modality in treating Parkinson's disease. This is the therapeutic use of dance to improve motor and non-motor symptoms. This involves specific movement strategies and music serves as an external cue to facilitate movement. Some of the dance techniques can be balance exercises. And if you dance with a specific intensity, it can be a strength training as well. And then it improves flexibility as it involves range of motion of several joints. And it is a form of aerobic exercise. So there are different dance types such as tango, waltz and foxtrots. And then uh, these are some uh, novel uh, methods that has been used in other countries such as martial arts, for example, Tai Chi, and then boxing is also getting popular in other countries as a management option for this disease. The boxing can be used to increase strength, improve hand-eye coordination, improving posture, better cognitive processing, stronger core, which can, be, which can lead to better gait, improve balance and agility, and improve reaction time. As a summary, uh, I would say that there are a lot of traditional physiotherapy techniques being used in treating Parkinson's disease, such as strength exercises, breathing, balance training, functional exercises, gait training, and flexi flexibility exercises. So in addition to these traditional training, there are some other uh, novel techniques also becoming uh, popular, such as cueing techniques, dance, and martial arts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadisha. The last speaker for this symposium is uh, Ms. Nandana Velage, who's uh, been in involved with the Institute of Neurology for a long, long time. He is currently the senior tutor in occupational therapy at the School of Physiotherapy. Uh, and he's going to talk to us on the role of the occupational therapist in rehabilitation of Parkinson's disease. Over to you, Nandana. Thank you. Good afternoon. My presentation is about the role of occupational therapist in rehabilitation of people with Parkinson's disease. Here is the content of my presentation today. First, I will briefly talk about what is occupational therapy, 
the theoretical background of the profession, models and approaches used in planning occupational therapy application for people with Parkinson's disease, and finally, occupational therapy interventions. Occupational therapy, or OT in short, is a client-centered approach concerned with promoting health and well-being of people of all ages with various physical and or mental illnesses through meaningful occupations. Meaningful occupations are the activities a person performs from the time of waking up in the morning until they retire to bed at night. Very often people think that OT is concerned with a type of therapy given to prepare a person to go back to their previous job occupation after an injury. But in reality, that is one aspect of OT. In fact, OT is way broader than that and is a holistic approach of treatment because both physical and mental aspect of the person are addressed. Therefore, the primary goal of OT is to enable people to participate independently in the entire range of human occupations, ranging from activities of daily living to work and leisure. Occupational therapy is based on person environment and occupational model or PEO model. According to the model, independent and best performance is dependent on three factors. The first factor is the person. This includes the ability of the person such as sensory skills, motor skills, cognitive skills, personality, etc. And best performance is also determined by the way that person perform occupation or engagement, such as routine, frequency, methods, tasks that are unique to person. Finally, the environment in which the person engage in activity also has an impact on the performance. As we know, after disabling condition, there is an imbalance of these three areas can be taken place. For instance, in case of Parkinson's disease, the capacity of the person is affected due to motor symptoms. In this case, initially the aim of OT is to restore the physical abilities as much as possible to optimal the performance. If the disability is irreversible and in Parkinson's disease, Occupational therapist will change the way of engaging in occupation and also change the environment to enhance performance. Expansion of occupation and environment may help to overcome the deficiencies in person, which will in turn enhance the performance. Therefore, major objective of occupational therapy is to prevent further deterioration or restore the functions. If restoration is not possible, then compensate the affected functions and also modify the environment to overcome limitations of performance. Several approaches or frames of reference are used by OTs to design treatment protocols. Commonly used frames of reference for people with Parkinson's disease are neurodevelopmental approach, biomechanical approach, learning frames of reference, and compensatory frames of reference. I'll explain these frames of reference in the following slides. The, the neurodevelopmental treatment is based on the reflex hierarchical theories and applied for upper motor function lesions. According to NDT, inhibiting abnormal reflex mechanism facilitate normal movement. The redevelopment of normal postural movements enable the redevelopment of normal body skill. Therefore, normal body movement is gained through tactile and kinesthetic stimulation through handling and movement. In occupational therapy, functional activities are used to regain normal movement pattern. Biomechanical approach is based on the relationship between musculoskeletal function and performance of the functional task. This approach assumes that the person has the capacity to improve voluntary control, such as joint range of motion, strength, and endurance when necessary. For people with Parkinson's disease, this approach is used only when mobility training is required. 
Learning frames of reference is based on the ability of the person to learn and relearn. People with Parkinson's disease need to be educated in management of the condition. Learning involves two areas, advice on utilization of time and the energy conservation. Training of anxiety management techniques for both patient and caregiver. Compensatory frames of reference is used when progressive nature of disease lead to reduced function and require compensation. This also has two approaches. Adaptive approach, which provides behavior modification and rearrangement of physical movement. And rehabilitative approach, which provides alternative supports in care assistance or use of appropriate assistive devices and equipments. OT conduct a thorough assessment to gather information on physical and functional level of disability. Based on the finding, the meaningful goals are set and appropriate frames of reference are identified. As the previous uh, speakers mentioned, often the horn and ya staging of Parkinson's disease is used to identify the level of disability of the person. As it is given, there are five stages. However, as these stages may often overlap, OTs usually divide these stages into two. That is, stage one to three is considered as initial stage and stage four to five as latter stage. Based on the finding of the assessment, OT intervention is planned. Individual and group activities are provided to restore or improve gross motor abilities such as general mobility, postural stability, and especially upper limb functions. OT also trains fine motor activities to improve finger dexterity and hand function. What is already done in the physiotherapy sessions will be reinforced at the OT unit and apply it to real life situations. The restorative activities enable to improve specific physical and psychological functions and helps to maintain self-care, self-esteem and also social interactions. In the latter stage, the remedial activities are aligned with daily life skills than training balance and coordination. Activities are designed to maintain the available functions. However, daily tasks can be utilized to maintain movements strength and coordination. This activity should be interested and meaningful to the person. To preserve self-esteem and dignity, it is important to maintain individual's appearance. The occupational therapist provides necessary advice and guidance on various aspects of personal care. When selecting clothing, OT assists person to select the type of clothing that is preferred and advised on the suitable type of materials, styles, which are easier to put on and take off. A person with Parkinson's disease is also assisted with selecting the right footwear with comfort, support, and easy to put on and removal. The type of footwear will depend on the level of mobility. Depending on the severity stage, an adjustment is made. For example, in shuffling, if shuffling, a shoe with leather or hard sole is more functional. If retropulsion or forwarding back, falling backwards is a problem, small heels or inserted heels lift may help. To prevent propulsion, low or flat heel is recommended. We know that motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease slow down the pace of eating, drinking, and swallowing. Therefore, person is assisted with maintaining optimum sitting position while feeding. To achieve that, discourage excessive flexion and of the trunk and maintain natural curve of neck and trunk. Reduce the distance between hand and mouth by raising the plate. Use elbow as a pivot facilitate hand and forearm movement. 
change the routine of meal cutlery with enlarged and heavier grips and weighted bracelets may decrease tremor patient is encouraged to wash independently as far as possible with the caregiver at a call in distance safe positions and arrangement of items to be kept in the washing and bathing area if measures are not safe alternatives and some adaptive equipments can be introduced in the very last stages bed baths will be replaced showering arrange seated position for washing in the basin and keep other items close to hand adaptation such as toothpaste dispenser enlarged toothbrush handle or electric toothbrush help the brushing teeth easier denture wearers are encouraged to continue their preferred methods to clean it in the initial stage patient is encouraged to have independent toileting if the transferring and mobility is affected raised toilets and grab bars are installed to overcome difficulty bidet shower toilet paper holders are placed within the reach brushing hair shaving makeup trimming nails should be maintained as long as possible to pre to preserve self esteem and dignity proper chair is introduced to facilitate optimum function such as relaxing eating working at a desk and place a wedge shaped cushion on the seat to facilitate standing functional transferring such as transferring in and out of car is trained at the initial stage encourage regular walks in the home environment active daily routine is planned however in the latter stage people with parkinson disease will need a wheelchair occupational therapist conduct wheelchair assessment to suit for the people to the person's level of disability and also to the needs of the person functional wheelchair mobility is trained and also caregiver is trained to maintain the wheelchair at latter stage speech and cognitive abilities will be impaired so occupational therapist work with speech therapy colleagues to augment communication especially in the writing communication in the written communication mitographia hinders writing if writing ability is impaired writing practice is conducted at first the person is trained fine motor skills and then to master patterns of writing and gradually progress to actual writing in latter stages adapted writing equipments are introduced work in the latter stage depend on the interest of the person and the complexity and the demand of the work modification of work environment can be done if not possible employer is encouraged to find him an alternative job premature retirement may be a traumatic experience for the patient it is important to find viable alternatives such as working from home or continuing unpaid work to occupy time persons with parkinson disease is encouraged to continue interest and leisure activities if person is unable to engage in previous leisure activities then occupational therapist help to select alternatives that uh, which are creative leisure activities and family members are also encouraged to maintain their own leisure activities as well as the person's leisure activity patient and caregiver education is very important so caregiver is advised to encourage person with parkinson disease to maintain good posture movement and mobility pattern and the caregiver is trained to perform relaxation techniques and caregiver is also advised when and how to help the patient and advices are given to the carer about his back care his or her back care and the general health 
So the benefits and the services available, such as social service department and non-governmental organization services are introduced and help the patient and help liaise with those agencies to get the support to make the patient independent and bring in the quality of life as long as possible. That's in my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nandana Velage, for your very informative and descriptive presentation. And uh, do we have the questions? Yeah, I think we have finished uh, well ahead of time. Uh, Rashan, will you, would you like to come up? Uh, the symposium is open for questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to get the ball rolling, uh, this question is open to all three speakers. Uh, I think we have seen a fair amount of uh, how cycling helps uh, control of Parkinson's disease. Do we have any understanding on how it happens? Still a lot of research is going on, sir. What they say is in uh, our brain, there are about thousands of tracks, right? For some reason, some tracks are working very well and some are being dormant, probably being they are not necessary. Right? For when the Parkinson's patient, when the, because of this pathology, certain uh, the, the normally working ones are getting closed, right? For when certain others, so for an example, if a person is not a cycling person and if he trained to something else, certain chemicals are released and the, the, the tracks which were dormant before get activated. So for an example, what they say, if a patient who couldn't walk even in a Parkinson's patient, if there's something frightening, maybe a snake or something, they can be able to walk or run even, right? So that they have seen. So for some reason, which they don't know what can, uh, what is the exact thing that they can do, but for some reason, if they change from the, the, the normal regular routine, there could be thing. That is what we do in the cue training also. For an example, your patient can't initiate. If you give some cue to change, for example, if they think that there's a block here, so they can jump and walk, something that's happening. So a lot of research is going on that aspect. That's why the rehabilitation has coming, playing a big role in advanced parkings at the moment. So uh, does that mean that uh, cyclists get less Parkinson's disease? Or is there any, uh, any data on that? Not no no exact reasons or not exact data on that, but it's a nice thing to look in, look into. Yeah, right. yeah, as the boxers getting a lot of Parkinson's there, so yeah, they are the other way around. See the protective factor. My question is from uh, all three actually. I would like to know from uh, Nadisha and uh, Nandana whether the rehabilitation of Parkinson's is included in their curricula. And then uh, from uh, Dashana, what challenges are there for us in establishing rehabilitation of Parkinson's in neurology? Shall I start in? The challenges, what I feel, we have all the resources. For an example, each and every neurology unit in the country, most of them, I would say, have some sort of backup from rehab, uh, the, the, the physiotherapist, occupation therapist, and speech following and other things. So. I think what is the challenge is we don't have a program as such and being neurologists and probably being the association of neurologists, the SLMA and other associations should take some initiative to start this one. Actually, I think the stroke was also such it about 15 years back. Now we have a little bit of a more organized stroke rehabilitation program in this country. So I think the next disease that we have to look for, uh, the, the rehabilitation is Parkinson's. We all have the facilities. I think the enthusiasm and the the leadership, what I would say from the neurologist will make a big difference. Uh, thank you, Madam, for the question. This is Nadi Shah. Uh, actually, um, regarding the curriculum, of course, I would say that for the BSc physiotherapy students, we have a significant amount of hours being allocated for uh, the Parkinson's disease, uh, a medical aspect as well as for physiotherapy. Uh, 
uh, physiotherapy uh, skills and training. Uh, but, in but with my experience with uh, Parkinson's uh, rehabilitation in Australia with my PhD, I see um, the rehabilitation setup is not such uh, not well improved uh, in Sri Lankan setup because I've seen that uh, uh, there, there are already set uh, programs which are running in hospitals, uh, specially allocated for uh, people with uh, certain uh, like disease stages, for example, mild to moderate patients, there are separate exercises. And then uh, for severe stage Parkinson's, they also have separate um, training sessions in overseas. So I, I would see uh, some lacking uh, component in Sri Lankan setup. Um, but of course, I think we, we can implement it. And also as a physiotherapist, I see uh, apart from the uh, traditional training that is being practiced in hospital, which is actually really important, I would acknowledge that but in addition to that we would make it uh, somewhat different and make it interesting for patients and make them uh, like uh, to make them adhere a lot to these programs rather than this traditional uh, apart from like in addition to the traditional training we can add some more novel techniques as well to the existing protocol yeah madam here Nand nandan here yeah, uh, that's a very, very good question, madam, that uh, as you know, that occupational therapy program in Sri Lanka is a diploma program, which is, uh, which is a two year diploma. So it is a very compact course. And therefore that we don't have that much of time allocated for rehabilitation, but we learn about Parkinson's disease and the management of Parkinson disease uh, in, in occupational therapy, uh, point of view, but not as organized in uh, rehabilitation as such. So that area needs to be developed in future. Uh, yeah. In the absence of any further questions, let me thank all three speakers, Dr. Darshan Sivisena, Dr. Nadisha Kalyani and Mr. Nandani Vilage for their excellent uh, speeches and the input. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Padma Gunratna will be presenting a certificate of uh, participation to Dr. Dashan Sisena. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think uh, we are on to the last session of the day and also the conference uh, that is on uh, cerebral palsy. So we have started with, uh, it's the brainchild of Dr. Padma Gunaratna, the president of the SLMA, which is the inaugural uh, conference in rehabilitation, medical rehabilitation. And we have listened to so many important topics in rehabilitation in adults. And now we are coming to the last session of the conference, which is the children. So uh, this is uh, from Lady Ridgeway Hospital. Uh, they are going to talk to us on teamwork in cerebral palsy. Uh, so the team is led by Dr. Jayatri Jagoda, who is a consultant in rheumatology and uh, rehabilitation medicine at Lady Ridgeway Hospital, uh, along with, the, with her team. This is Malka Jayatilaka, who is a speech and language therapist. And then Ms. Nuan Rodrigo, the physiotherapist at Patrick Way, and Mrs. Uh, Sumudu Nisansala, occupational therapist, and uh, Mrs. Porsia Tisera, the prosthetist and orthotist at Lady Way Hospital. So uh, I think it's a very important topic, uh, cerebral palsy. We know that teamwork has improved outcomes in children in many ways. So we will. Uh, Listen to Jayatri how she manages her team. But over to you, Jayatri. Let me for giving us this opportunity in this prestigious first conference of rehabilitation. So today we are going to talk about uh, cerebral palsy, how uh, we work in a team, and um, as the story of Miss Fatima unfolds, uh, uh, we are talking it in a case scenario. Uh, this is my team. Uh, as uh, Dr. Saraji already 
introduce them. I'll go straight away to my talk. Uh, this is a kind of a broad topic to talk on cerebral palsy. So uh, my talk today will not be that deep. It's uh, a superficial quick run through uh, as a team leader. My team will elaborate how we uh, manage this case. So um, this is the story of Miss Fatima. It's not her true name. I'm really grateful to these parents. They allowed us to share the videos of the child. So uh, we are able to learn from her case. So she's a six year old, six years and seven month old girl, third in the family of four children. And she has uh, faced so much of perinatal insult in uh, the sense he is the first born of twins at 30 weeks of a uh, period of amenorrhea. Uh, it was a vaginal delivery and birth weight was this 1.9 kilograms. There was respiratory arrest around birth and surfactant given, and she was ventilated for three days and treated for sepsis. So enough insult to have a, a impairment uh, in the brain function. So on presentation at one and a half years, now this girl presented to us in one and a half years of her age, which should not be happening. Uh, now there are a lot of uh, uh, protocols being made and uh, screening tools are developed. And Sri Lanka is working on to adopt screening of all at-risk children because we can cl clearly see um, this um, our um, uh, girl was clearly at risk because she had so much of perinatal insult at birth. So on presentation after one and a half years, she had had control, but she has achieved it late at eight months. She was rolling over um, and she could sit with support. And she had developed some uh, palmer grasp, uh, yet not developed pincer grasp. She was reaching for toys and transferring toys successfully. She was fixing and following objects. There was good eye contact, but there were stiff limbs, brisk reflexes, increasing, increased and variable tone. Uh, she understood and responded to simple verbal commands and had a vocabulary of three to four single words. So quite um, significantly affected at one and a half years. Uh, she could only do supported sitting um, with the curved back. So then uh, uh, she was evaluated in a pediatric unit and the diagnosis of cerebral palsy was made and referred for rehabilitation to our team. Uh, so that takes us to the question, what is cerebral palsy? It is the most common motor disability of childhood. It's due to an insult to the developing brain uh, rather than uh, uh, just a normal developing brain suddenly faces some insult. So it's a group of conditions with variable severity having some common developmental features in a very broad sense. It's, it's prevalent about 1.5 to 2.5 uh, per thousand live births. So if you look at the definition, uh, this definition came in around 2007, which uh, describes uh, cerebral palsy better than uh, the pre-existing uh, definitions. So cerebral palsy describes a group of permanent disorders of development of movement and posture. It's primarily a movement and posture disorder causing activity limitation that are attributed to non-progressive disturbance that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. So the motor disorder of cerebral palsy is often accompanied by disturbance of sensation, perception, cognition, communication, and behavior by epilepsy and by secondary musculoskeletal problems. This part um, was not in uh, the previous uh, definition. So this is a better uh, description by Rosenbaum and et al. Uh, the diagnosis, how do we diagnose? So it's clinical history and examination, which would uh, tell us that children, there are children at risk. So in our case, uh, history uh, uh, told us clearly that the child has uh, 
had uh, many perinatal problems. He was the first of twins and there was uh, birth asphyxia, ventilated and so on. Um, this can happen in the prenatal period uh, at birth or postnatal period. So the history will tell us that the child is going to be at risk. So now uh, the world has uh, identified the importance of early diagnosis, early diagnosis. So all at-risk uh, children are screened for cerebral palsy in developed countries. So how do we screen these children? So um, there are, uh, I just briefly mentioned what are the most important things that we use to detect cerebral palsy early. It's called, there's a simple, uh, uh, observation of general movements, uh, which is, uh, which we can do it at no cost, only the matter of training uh, the uh, teams, the physiotherapists, doctors, and um, OT, uh, whoever is trained, a nurse can take a video and uh, the teams can come together uh, and look at it later and do it, um, detect the general movements abnormal general movements and imaging like ultrasound, MRI, MRI, MRI has high degree of specificity as sensitivity and certain assessment tools like Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination. Uh, combined, uh, if you combine the general movements and the hind, it has about 98% of predictability for developing cerebral palsy. So it's very important to detect at-risk children uh, because early interventions matter. So general movements assessments, there is a timing for general movements. There are two types of general movements, which are writhing movements and fidgety movements, which uh, writhing movements start from fetal life and go on for some time after birth. And then they overlap with fidgety movements. So there are two windows to look at writhing and look at fidgety movements. I don't want to go into details so that I need to give time to others. So um, how does it happen? Um, nobody actually quite uh, uh, has learned enough of this. There's much heterogeneity observed. Proper understanding to explain the spectrum of variations and enabling specific strategic interventions of management uh, and prevention is yet to come. So it is thought of due to brain injury rather than developmental abnormality. The stage of maturity of the brain at the time of insult determines the type and site of the brain lesion. So um, this slide uh, shows in brief what um, implications uh, the uh, brain can, uh, the cerebral palsy uh, pathophysiology. Uh, it's an upper motor neuron problem uh, rising uh, from the cortical development. So lack of cortical inhibition causes so many problems that are called positive features. Um, which is plasticity that leads to so many other secondary problems and weakness on the other hand, which is a negative feature and lack of coordination. Uh, uh, it's a brief uh, one slide containing all the pathophysiology. So there are motor types, spastic, dyskinetic, mixed types and ataxic. Uh, and uh, depending on the area of the brain that is affected, uh, we can classify the motor types. Uh, uh, hemiplegia, diplegia, quadriplegia, ethetoid, and uh, dyskinetic and ataxic. So there are functional classifications which enable us to explain and communicate between the uh, teams. So this is the most commonly uh, used uh, classification GMFCS level. This uh, the pictures that you see are used to classify children from six to 12 years of age. But if you get children below and above, there are uh, certain modifications to this, which is called uh, GMFCS E and R, ex expanded and revised. That is, if we take the um, children before second birthday, this is how it goes. There are again five levels. Um, So it basically uh, tells you um, when uh, children in uh, early childhood, it is difficult to 
assess them with the uh, first picture. Uh, so there is a way to assess even younger children uh, and put them into GMFCS level. That's what I wanted to highlight here. So there are other uh, ways to classify manual ability classification to uh, classify hand function, and there is CFCS to classify speech and so on. So um, in our story, by two years of age, our uh, little girl has developed pincer grasp. She could feed herself with a biscuit, play with toys using both hands, transfer toys between hands. Then now she's, she, can, she could roll over, but no sitting balance, needed support to maintain sitting, had a curved back. There's marked adductor hamstring and tear tightness. And there's dystonia noted only five to six single words she could talk by that time. So now uh, we have classified uh, with this as spastic diplegia because as you can see, her hands are um, functioning better, much better than, than her uh, lower limbs. So it's a spastic diplegic CP with dystonia. So we could call it a mixed type CP. Um, she falls into the category of GMFCS4 as she only can have head control and a little rolling over, no sitting balance. It's with very big support and a curved back. So max, but her max level is level one where she can uh, transfer objects and uh, things very uh, efficiently. So um, how did we intervene? So we arranged occupational therapy, physiotherapy, uh, speech and language therapy and uh, repeated MDT discussions were carried out with goal setting. Uh, with ben six hall and Baclofen were started and the doses had been modified from time to time. And she was given Botox, botulinum toxin twice at the age of two years and six months to gastroxolis and hamstrings at five years again to adductors hamstrings and hamstrings and gastroxolis. All these has happened in, uh, uh, in assessment and careful discussion after MDT assessments. Then she was referred to uh, our PNO colleagues as well for a force to stabilize the feet um, and hip surveillance has been done. Luckily, her hips have not migrated, maybe due to the early interventions, though she was a, a diplegic. Uh, and uh, by now we have discussed with the surgeon, uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, for surgic about regarding any surgical interventions that are needed. So, um, so this slide I adapt from Dr. Nihagunathilaka, my beloved teacher in cerebral palsy. So this is how we try to assess, uh, uh, conduct our multidisciplinary meetings, we first assess the child with uh, all her skills, muscle balance, motor control, stability of joint will be assessed. And then we identify problems and discuss with the parents to see what their perception and do they understand or what's going on and so on and what are their goals and expectations. Then we, uh, in the MDC, we set short-term goals, which are SMART. Um, SMART goal is a specific, measurable, achievable, and repeatable and trackable with time. My uh, team will be talking about these goals. So then we lay down a treatment plan and then the next MDC, we um, reassess uh, short-term goals, whether they have achieved or not, and um, GMFC is level and the final outcome uh, and we monitor therapy. So in this case, uh, we were interrupted from time to time. This girl is straight from Atalugama. So since the uh, COVID uh, pandemic started and even before that, she has been a regular default and she wouldn't wear at the Air Force. She wouldn't do uh, certain things that we wanted her to, but then uh, we uh, were reinforcing therapy again. So uh, then, uh, if we uh, talk of the normal scenarios, when we uh, assess, uh, conduct these uh, MDC meetings, we come to sometimes developmental delay or arrest, and then we modify our goals. And even if we come to a developmental arrest, or uh, we have things, certain things to do and look after these families, uh, we have a holistic approach 
uh, as you will see um, in a few minutes as my team talks. So interventions in cerebral palsy, this is one brief slide that I want to, uh, you know, draw your attention to. I don't have time to go into the details of this. This is a famous uh, uh, review uh, done by Noak, uh, famous Noak et al. Uh, article, uh, people who know about cerebral palsy, they're familiar with this. This is called traffic lights, where they looked into all the interventions that are being done for cerebral palsy and see the effectiveness of that. So your green circles uh, uh, are for, you know, good interventions, uh, good uh, randomized controlled trials with uh, positive outcomes, uh, proven positive outcomes. That gives us the uh, uh, best evidence uh, to practice. So your yellow ones are uh, probably uh, beneficial, but they may not harm, we don't know. Uh, the red interventions, you, you don't do them, they are harmful. So this is a, a, a very good uh, uh, insight that we got uh, recently. This, is, uh, this was once done in 2013 and then reviewed in 2020 again. Um, so, um, uh, few of these uh, uh, best interventions, if I talk, uh, there are uh, by manual therapy, uh, constraint induced therapy, and uh, botulinum toxin, and casting for TA tightness. And uh, the, there are different domains. So you have motor functions, you have a different domain, speech and language and occupational therapy, they have different domains, uh, divided into different domains. So um, I recommend uh, if uh, you are working on cerebral palsy, everybody, including the therapists, should read this article. So um, how therapy should be implemented is uh, we don't do passive movements. They are not of no benefit. Uh, they should be task specific, but variable and child should be mentally and physically en engaged in the activity, so it should be intensive and incrementally challenging, should be play based, the child should enjoy doing this. And when the ch children are, uh, you know, older, should uh, take into account the aerobic fitness uh, also to be improved. So external support, memorizing and repeating activities are less effective. Any surgical intervention should be after careful evaluation and discussion with an uh, experienced orthopedic surgeon, which we are lucky that we have Dr. Sunil Vijay Singh at LRH. We always have MDT discussions with him uh, and uh, we carefully evaluate the patients before embarking on surgery. So. So what did we achieve sticking to all those things we tried, uh, attempted to achieve and what did we achieve? So she achieved lying to sitting and dynamic sitting with straight back. What dynamic sitting is the child can sit and use both hands. He doesn't need to support herself with her hands. So, and four point kneeling by four years, uh, sit to stand with minimal support, walking with the use of a handheld device by six years. Her GMFCS level now is level three, which was level four before we started our interventions. So um, I wish to take you through this slide. I hope it works. Uh, I'm so sorry, the slide has rotated. Uh, Um, even if the slide has rotated, I don't know how it happened. It was originally upright. Uh, but uh, as you can see, she can stand now without uh, holding onto something with the hands. After stabilizing the feet, she can come to standing without any uh, upper limb uh, help.
So this is how she walks at the moment. She uh, can use a handheld device. And uh, her gait, I didn't have time to talk of gait analysis and so on, but gait analysis is the primary uh, uh, thing, one of the basic things that we have to do in cerebral palsy. She analyzes her gait. Her ankles are, are having an angle more than 90 degrees and the knees are bent. Um, this is this gait pattern we call uh, type 4 diplegic gait or jump gait uh, and uh, I think you can notice that uh, she's bent midway between the ankle and the uh, toes when she achieves the momentum so that is called midfoot mid bridge so there are a few problems there so we need to address those things. And if we can, we have to strengthen her muscles and get her to stand properly. Uh, so the way forward from here, uh, she doesn't have standing balance. So we try to achieve standing balance. We don't know, we try to achieve independent walking. Um, how to achieve, uh, how to uh, go forward from here is, uh, my team, uh, for my team to talk. And uh, as a medical person, we have made discussions with our respected orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so after the discussion, these are the decisions we came uh, to. She will benefit with hamstring release, no surgical interventions for uh, tendo Achilles, uh, that is gastroxolis complex. So if I go back to this slide again, as you can see, she's already bent at the knees, bent at the hips. If we do anything wrong here, anything wrong at the ankles, she will start crouching, which is she already goes to almost 90 at the ankle uh, with the midfoot bridge. If we do anything wrong here, the child would go crouching. So you have to be very careful from here. So, uh, our surgeon uh, very correctly decided no surgery for tender Achilles. Uh, that she needs a lot of strengthening pelvic girdle thigh muscles and the tibial is posterior. So that is the discussion with the orthopedic surgeon. And these are my uh, references. I would like to hand it over to my team from here. I'd like to thank all my teachers and the family of this girl who gracefully gave us permission to show her videos and um, over to my team. Thank you. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the speech and language therapy perspective in teamwork in cerebral palsy. I'm Malka Gatilaka, the senior speech and language therapist at Lady Hospital. As a speech and language therapist, we have main, two main domains to assess their speech and language skills and solving difficulties. In this case, we first, first we identify the concerns in communication, eating and drinking skills aspects. First, we found word reading problem and storytelling problem as mother's main concerns. And also we were found that the child is having a limited vocabulary. Normally, like in a typical development, child should develop 2,600 word expressive vocabulary and they should have 2,000 20,000 to 24,000 deceptive vocabulary. But we were found this child is having a limited vocabulary. And also the, she has a limited spoken language compared with the peer group. And also she had difficulty in narrative speech, difficulty in letters and number recognition, and also a difficulty in words decoding. To find out the areas of assessment to find out the other like development skills we have done informal and formal assessment to find out their child's language skills uh, comprehension and expression comprehension and expression can be non-verbal or verbal level even in the verbal level it can be one word level comprehension two word level or it can be complex word level so we had to continue the assessments to find out the child's language skills 
and also we assessed child's attention and listening skills, cognitive levels, oromotor skills, speech skills like in speech skills we were found we assessed the child's speech intelligibility uh, how with whether the child's speech is intelligible for others to understand or not pragmatics such as eye contact turn taking whether the child is able to maintain a conversation initiate a conversation influencing mainly refers to the continuation uh, and smoothing the rate and the effort in speech production in lit literal literacy skills we were assist we assist child's writing and reading skills and also eating and drinking skills were uh, assessed uh, this child is uh, the, this child had normal development in eating and drinking skills and hearing and vision this is really important for the communication development so we collected all the medical reports and the hearing test results and the vision test results before starting the therapy activities to find out the child's levels according to the findings like uh, concerns we used these two theoretical framework to find out the child's levels of development we used international classification for function icf model and the communication function classification system cfcs then uh, let's see how we going to fix the child to the international classification for function we found the communication as the disorder and the body function and the structures we were found the child is having a difficulty in narrative speech the activity limitation the child had a difficulty in explain or describe an incidents according to the participation restriction she had a less interaction in school and other settings except home according to the communication function classification system actually this child is in cfcs level 1 it means this child is a effective sender and receiver with unfamiliar and familiar partners these are the assessment findings uh, which we have conducted with the child in formal and formal assessments the comprehension level is in five word level level she could understand a complex sentence expression level three to four word level sentences she could understand she could express a sentence like i eat protein her vocabulary is not age appropriate attention and listening skills her attention span age appropriate and her attention is in level 6 it means she had a integrated integrated and sustained attention according to the renal 1977 according to the oral motor skill assessment we found the child is having adequate oral motor functions her speech is intelligible her cognition is like uh, she could understand prepositions shapes colors uh, numbers actually only when in order letters she could recognize few letters only uh, reading uh, actually it was difficult to the child she could read with someone's support in writing skills she could write her name and copywriting according like when we are considering about pragmatics she had adequate eye contact and she could uh, initiate a conversation and to maintain a conversation according to the our finding our assessments the communication and eating drinking diagnosis is she has a speech and language disorder learning difficulties secondary to cerebral palsy then we design the intervention plan intervention plan it consists of long term aims and short term aims for long term aims um, we were expected to child to develop child would be able to improve narrative speech consistently in home setting with minimal prompts and the second aim is letter recognition consistently with 70% accuracy third aim number recognition 
1 to 20 consistently with 70% accuracy. To achieve these uh, long term aims, we set short term aims. It means at the end of three months, child would be able to describe an incidence with pictures, cues, example normal routine in a day in a structured activity and storytelling with at least five sentences with visual cues to improve letter recognition of 10 letters in 50% accuracy improve number recognition 1 to 10 100% accuracy then i would like to give an example activity for the for aim 2 aim 2 was storytelling with at least five sentences with visual cues at the end of three months child would be able to tell a story with at least five sentences with visual cues at this stage the child's current level was difficult to build up a story then our immediate aim is at the end of the session child would be able to tell five steps of a story without prompts then we designed an activity let the child to sequence pictures according to a story with minimum support then and child should describe step by step with pictures if the child is unable to do this then uh, if the child is able to do this activity easily then we plan a step up activity sequence the story without support if the child is unable to do the activity uh, with the minimum support then we had to step down then we plan to do the activity sequence with complete support uh, actually the home take home message i should give to you early intervention and multidisciplinary team is really important for the better prognosis speech and language therapist is one of the key members in multidisciplinary team team early referral enhance the communication journey thank you i would like to over the session to mr tuakaran thank you role of physiotherapist in multidisciplinary intervention for cerebral palsy i am mr vitu aragan physiotherapist lady ricky hospital for children uh, my intervention process used me sorry uh, first of all we have to go on initial data collection the baby is six years and seven months old she is referred from DRLRH at one year of age to our department of physiotherapy uh, she has uh, delayed gaining motor milestones uh, for example she has developed head control after eight months of her born uh, according to our assessment she is in GMFCS level 3. Uh, currently, she is attending to our rehabilitation program once in one month at LRH and following a home program it designed by a physiotherapist. Uh, then we should identify the concerns. Uh, in the concerns, uh, there are three concerns. Difficulties in sitting to standing and no independent standing balance and consistently exhibiting spastic scissoring and equinus when standing and walking with support uh, then we have to identify the relevant theory child can't maintain her standing posture through normal muscle activity uh, then we have to decide what are the goals for our treatment the goals should be smart then uh, these are the parallel uh, these are the goals initial goals enhance the development of posture and movement by four weeks improve strength in the tongue pelvic and core muscles better aligning the body improving the base of support in standing and reduce tightness in hlis tendon hamstring and hip adductors 
biomechanical consideration of us is uh, inability to achieve a base of support in standing i will show the video later she can't maintain her standing balance uh, even for a second uh, and then in uh, difficulties in independent sitting to standing difficulties in maintain proper standing posture then our motor planning are difficulties in isolating movement in the lower limb she can't move the limb in the hip flexion without knee movements she has uh, developed some kind of uh, collected movements uh, this is a result of an a disord a disordered motor control overriding effect of spastic contractures at multiple level then we will move to the assess body structure fun act function activity and participation so we have done gmfm uh, gmfm 88 summary score uh, we have we done in that uh, gmfm we have calculated uh, lying rolling sitting crawling and kneeling standing and walking running jumping in that score we calculated as lying to rolling total score 51 but baby has developed only 49 sitting is also almost okay because according to our gmfm analysis we calculated as she has achieved 58 out of 60. then crawling and kneeling she has developed 36 out of 42 it means uh, 85, 85.7 but percentage then we can uh, we have um, to move on standing in standing she has developed only 9 out of 39 it means very less in the dimension uh, 23.07 uh, next walking running and jumping total dimension is uh, 72 but she has developed only 22 it means 30 point five six but uh, it uh, so we have to consider we have to concentrate on standing balance to develop standing balance because she has to develop on that um then other things um, total score was 66.42 so we have to summarize uh, those gmfm according to that gmfm at last visit we have done then we could find find about lying to rolling is 96 sitting is 80 percentage crawling and kneeling 85.71 percentage standing is 23.07 percentage and walking running jumping and jumping was uh, 30.56 these are the our assessment forms for juice calculate the uh, gmfm so in this gmfm we have calculated for an example lying to rolling uh, how to baby perform in supine position prone position in the sitting uh, how she uh, sit on with hand support and sit on mat long sitting sit on the floor we calculate we checked uh, those things and marked as 0 1 2 3 and summarized those things then we have to move on body structure function range of motion muscle length and modified cardio cardio is a scale for measuring spasticity that take account resistance to passive movement at both slow and fast speed um, we done range of motion measurements in knee joint and adductors in shape and gastrocnemius also soleus our range of motion are limited in the knee joint and both of right and leg and also adductors show some kind of tightness compared to soleus gastrocnemius has more tightness in our assessment then we have to identify the contextual factors 
um, environmental factors are she is attending mainstream school grade two. She lives an extended family, so family support is there. They are following our exercise program in home properly. Always getting compared with the twin in physical abilities, it will hurt that baby. And personal factors are huh? keen to participate in school activities and play, happily engaging therapy activities. Then we have to move on management plan. Uh, before that, uh, we discussed early as we discussed in earlier, we find some problem list. According to that problem list, we have to go to the management plan. Our assessment findings are poor standing balance, difficulties in independent sitting standing, mixed contractures in hamstring, hip adductors, contributing to mobility, mobility restrictions. A reduced heel strike because of calf tightness in both of lower extremities. Weakness in quadriceps in bilateral lower limbs. Those are our assessment findings. Then we can uh, design the goals. The goals should be smart, specific, measurable, and achievable, realistic. And also these goals should be have a timeline. Our goals are to achieve muscle power as grade 5 in quadriceps bilaterally because as we discussed in earlier the baby have some kind of weakness near to muscle power 4 she can do the gravity against activities but can't do the maximal power movements then uh, to achieve ability of independent sit to stand within some seconds within 5 seconds and also to initiate and achieve static standing balance. Uh, now she uh, can't stand uh, even for a second. So we have to achieve the static standing balance. We have to use some therapeutic uh, standing frames. And also I will explain in later with the diagram. Uh, the next goal is to reduce tightness in hamstring calf adductors in the hip bilaterally. Uh, to reduce tightness, we have to do some functional movements and encourage supported lateral walking in proper weight bearing on her legs. So let's uh, discuss the goals. It should be smart, specific, measurable and achievable, also realistic. So we will move on to goals. The goal one to achieve muscle power in quadriceps from grade five, four to grade five by three months. So next visit will be by three months because baby living in a far place from our hospital. So she can't, we can't bring the baby frequently because of currently ongoing COVID issue. Um, so we have, we designed some uh, quadriceps uh, strengthening program using kicking the balls and also high toe therapy activities. Sorry for, I couldn't play the video by some technical error. Uh, our goal, uh, next goal is to achieve ability of independence to stand within five seconds by three months. Um, maybe can hold uh, bar or uh, an object and she try to sitting she is trying to sitting now so we have to encourage we have to engage the sitting sit to stand within five seconds independently so we have to uh, stabilize the lower limb and strength to the pelvic girdle muscles the goal three is to achieve independent static standing balance for five seconds by three months. We, our time is three months. We hope we can achieve the uh, independent standing balance. We can't stand even for a second now. So we, our task is, our goal is uh, uh, improving as five seconds. Uh, our goal four is, fourth goal is to reduce tightness in hamstring and calf bilaterally 
an expected new range of motion as knee joint right and left by 10 degrees and also angle joint bilaterally by 5 degree by 3 months as we discussed in our assessment knee range of motion is 53 in right side and also 60 so we have to improve that to get a proper standing balance so our goal is reduce tightness in hamstring so we have to done some functional movements as you see in picture we have we can develop angle range of motion by these these functional activities then uh, uh, let's move on goal five uh, our goal fifth goal is improve supported walking in proper weight bearing pattern lateral walking for five steps five steps is not much uh, it's not a uh, big task for baby now because we have three months so we expecting we are expecting in this uh, position baby's heel should be touched in the floor completely and back should be in straight position so how we how we will evaluate our outcomes after three months we will repeat our gmfm then we can compare how much it developed and also we will discuss with our team and parents uh, what are the barriers they faced then how we can uh, give a solution how we can become overcome the barriers so finally i will discuss about the functional goals of the uh, baby is a child would be able to maintain sit to stand without any support child would be able to stand on feet flat against a wall with a back straight and count 10 slowly it means the standing balance child would be able to stand from a chair without holding a bar to reach a toy child and child would be able to cross five steps each child without crossing her legs thank you Thank you, Tua. Uh, I am Sumudu Nisansala, occupational therapist at Ledridge Hospital. Uh, I would like to present you the current situation and the future plans of Fatima. Uh, and as an occupational therapist, what I can do to make positive changes in her life. Right, first of all, to identify her background, abilities, disabilities, and strengths and weaknesses, I conducted an assessment using uh, international classification of functioning. When I considering her uh, body functions and structures, uh, max level that is manual ability classification system level is 2 and uh, her fine motor skills and muscle strength is poor in left more than right she is right uh, her dominant side is right side she is having limitations in bimanual hand use fine motor activities especially in left hand and uh, also movement limitations and limitations in walking due to the, these limitations she's facing difficulties in outdoor play and adl activities such as dressing low body and cleaning uh, after toileting and uh, grooming such as wearing hair bands and uh, hair clips. Uh, and also she has uh, difficulties in participation, pa participating extracurricular activities at school. Uh, 
when we consider about the environmental factors, she is uh, having a very supportive family, but, but sometimes mother is uh, over supportive and she is having a, a twin brother and uh, no, no any significant social barrier. When looking into the personal factors, her uh, cognition is in such satisfactory level, uh, but there is a small delay in academic works due to lack of exposure due to this, uh, this corona season. She is very cooperative for therapy and uh, willing to do self-care without uh, mother's support. After identifying these factors, uh, I want to set goals to plan her treatment. Uh, for that, I used Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. Uh, it is a very, very client-centered practice and uh, it is used in the beginning of the intervention. So at the beginning, we are asking the client to think about his or her uh, typical day and list down the activities which are uh, difficult for them to fulfill. Then uh, we list, list down the, uh, the issues under three headings, their self-care, productivity and leisure. After listing the uh, problems, uh, we ask the client to rate them using 1 to 10 scale according to the importance of each activity. Then we select the uh, five most important uh, issues for the patient and uh, list, list them uh, in, a, in a, another table and ask them to uh, then rate according to their performance and satisfaction level in in the beginning um, so for this uh, this girl i have identified uh, these five issues difficulty in dressing lower extremity socks and shoes slip and slippers second one is difficulty in pouring water and washing after toileting Third is difficulties in grooming, wear hair bands and hair clips. Fourth, difficulty in cutting, cutting through a line smoothly using scissors. Last one is difficulty in opening sealed foils on yogurt cups. Uh, after uh, rating them uh, according to their um, performance and satisfaction uh, we getting we are getting a total score and uh, di divided divide them separately by the number of problems after doing treatments for the relevant time period we are doing a reassessment and compare these scores This is my plan. First one is to improve the quality of bimanual usage and uh, upgrade the manual ability classification system level into one. Uh, second is make a child-friendly environment 
to fulfill day to day activities third is strengthening upper limbs to reduce limitations of hand performances fourth one is to improve in hand manipulation and motor practice of both hands uh, fifth one is to encourage participation in life skills and the last is to make independent completely in activities of daily living uh i have set uh, four short term goals my first short term goal is to make independent her low, low body dressing um, within one month time in 1990 sitting, sitting position second is making independent in toileting completely within six week time third is to make independent in grooming that is wearing hair bands and hair clips within one month and the last one is uh, uh, to make independent making a paper board without uh without support making a paper board accurately so some i short term goals this is noaks uh, traffic light system of intervention in cerebral palsy children uh, i used some of these strategies to achieve my goals this is by manual training in the pictures you can see uh, child is engaging in activities by using both hands mm. these are the activities i used uh, for fatima to strength her uh, upper limbs this picture uh, shows the environmental modifications uh, at her home in in the bathroom uh, in the first picture you can see a grab bar has been added and a wash basin has been kept kept uh, uh, to uh, wash her face into her according to her uh, height in these pictures you can see uh, some goal directed and task specific training uh, such as uh, putting a hair band and wearing a hair clip and wearing a band and uh, using a scissor and use pencil etc and in this uh, picture you can see a child is engaging in play activities uh, with their friends and uh, with their friends and uh, with her siblings in her uh, home environment these are the strategies i use to achieve my goals and uh, after uh, after a relevant time period we uh, again doing the 
copum assessment and doing this score and uh, we can compare the uh, improvement. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, Mrs. Koshia will continue uh, this story. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sumudu. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how I contribute to my team as an orthodist. Uh, um, I think I'm most of them uh, not familiar with orthotics or orthosis. So before I move to our little girl story, I would like to give a brief introduction about uh, orthotics and orthosis. Uh, let's see uh, what is an orthosis. Uh, an orthosis is a device which is fitted to the outside of the body to support a weakness, correct or prevent a deformity maintain joint stability and enhance function with better positioning. Uh, the main goal of uh, orthotic treatment is to maximize the child's function to the best of his or her ability within the limits of the child's motor capabilities. Uh, orthosis for CP may be considered for the following reasons to assist walking and to maintain corrected position. A4 is currently the most commonly used orthosis for the CP child. A4 helps to prevent forms of peak minus at the ankle and a stability in standing. By maintaining the ankle at a neutral or slightly dorsiflex position, a reduction in hyperextension can be achieved. According to GMFCS level, level 1 to level 3 children need orthotic management to improve the quality of walking. Level 4 and level 5 patients are mostly wheelchair bound and they need orthotic management to prevent secondary complications such as contractures or scoliosis. Uh, to correct or control a deformity, we use biomechanical principle. For that, we use a three-point pressure system and ground reaction force. In three-point uh, three pressure system, we use three forces. Uh, one main corrective force at the joint and two stabilizing forces. It is not always possible to fully correct alignment of joint. Uh, some cases uh, we can prevent a poorly aligned joint from worsening. Uh, you can see two pictures here. One is equinus and another one is a calcaneus. For correct the equinus forces, uh, force number two is the main corrective force and force one and three are uh, stabilizing forces. Uh, picture to next one, uh, the force uh, one and two are the uh, stabilizing forces and uh, calcaneal force is the main corrective force. Uh, some cases we can't actually put uh, pressure over the bones. So in that case, we split the force into two and uh, place one uh, force uh, above the uh, joint and below the joint. Uh, here you can see how orthosis apply forces onto our body. So force A and B are stabilizing forces and C is uh, main corrective force. A4 posterior shelf and foot plate part provide stab stabilizing forces and force C uh, strap uh, provide the main corrective force. Uh, here in coronal plane uh, deformity, we correct. Uh, C is the main corrective force, and uh, force A and B are stabilizing forces. Here you can see different types of uh, lower limb orthosis. Uh, picture A is rigid A4, picture B is ground reaction A4, picture C flexible A4, D jointed A4 uh, is supramalleolar supramalleal orthosis, F is foot orthosis. Uh, children with CP walks in very different ways. Uh, children must be assisted individually. So for that, uh, we use a gate classification. Here I'm using MSRM gate classification. Uh, we have five types of gates. Uh, type uh, one uh, is the problem with the swing face uh, and initial contact with forefoot. And type 2, knee hyperextension in stance with heel contact. Type 3, knee hyperextension in stance without heel contact. 
Type 4 needs flexion mid stance and terminal stance without heel contact. Type 5 needs flexion in mid stance and terminal stance without heel raised. Uh, so, uh, to correct it, type 1, the problem is initial contact. So, for this, we can go for a simple solution uh, like a half high shoe or a boot. To correct uh, gait type 2, uh, we can use a jointed A4. To correct gait type 3, we can use rigid A4 to correct hyperextension and incomplete foot contact. Uh, to correct gate type 4, uh, we can use a rigid ground reaction force A4. Uh, to correct gate type 5, we can use ground reaction A4 with reinforced foot plate. Here you can get a clear idea how patient walks with and without orthosis. Picture A, the patient walking without a device and he is having foot drop during swing phase and initial contact with forefoot. And picture B, he walks with the orthosis and initially contact with the heel and uh, he has a good clearance uh, during swing phase. Picture C, uh, his, uh, when standing in mid stance, he has excessive knee flexion. Uh, with the device, it's almost controlled and he has a normal gait. Okay, let's move to our little girl's story. Uh, now, uh, she has uh, excessive hip flexion, knee flexion, and uh, foot is in plantar flex position. Uh, but she gets this dorsal flexion angle uh, by bending the midfoot. Uh, for uh, second picture, you can uh, see clearly midfoot break. My orthotic objectives are improve standing balance by providing a good base of support, accommodate and prevent further deformities. Uh, facilitate uh, training in skills uh, and initiate supported walking in proper weight bearing on her legs. Uh, let's see how she uh, this uh, kid going to stand with the orthosis. With the air force, she has less bending all the joints. Compare with this picture, now she has a more stable posture. Because of this straight posture, now she can pass her body weight to the feet uh, more easily. Uh, fit also in a better position to accept the weight. Here same, uh, now she has a good base of support to bear her weight. Due to that, her central gravity also has moved to much higher level than without orthosis. Uh, so one of our goal is initiate supported walking. Uh, we initiate her walking with an assistive device. Before we assess a gait, let me explain about gait cycle. Uh, gait cycle can be broken down in two primary phases, stand phase and swing phase. Stand phase is entire time the foot is in contact with the ground. Swing phase consists of entire time that the foot is in the air. Uh, so when she is walking uh, during swing phase, uh, no foot clearance over the ground, foot is dragging throughout the swing phase, no preparation of a limb for stance. And during stance phase, no heel strike, initial contact with the uh, forefoot, uh, hip and knee remain in flex position, uh, ankle in plantar flex position. Uh, there is an outer uh, stance because of mood, uh, mid foot break. And she quickly transfers the body weight to the other leg. Uh, now she, uh, you can see gait with the A4. Now she has foot clearance throughout the swing phase. The amount of forefoot touching area has increased. So she's trying to lower down her feet uh, to the ground. Uh, I made this Air Force more recently. So she needs to learn to rewalk with Air Force. Uh, actually, we can't expect a huge change of walking style within short period. And other thing is, uh, due to this pandemic situation, uh, there was a more than one year gap without uh, orthosis. Uh, so she needs some time and more gait training to adapt to Air Force. Uh, actually, she is very cooperative, very smart kid. So I know she will quickly achieve a much nicer gait pattern.
thank you for giving this opportunity. Over to Ms. Samanmali. Thank you, Portia. Now I will discuss on socioeconomic support in holistic care. As a social worker, my role is to identify socioeconomic problems of children and families with disabilities uh, coming to our clinic and also to link um, their needs with available resources in the community. These are my objectives of today's uh, presentation. The main objective is to understand the importance of socioeconomic support for the families with children with disabilities, special reference to this uh, case, a child with cerebral palsy. The other objective is to motivate parents, caregivers to use those services in the community for their well-being. There are some interesting facts which I would like to share with you all now. According to the World Bank report, uh, March 2021, persons with disabilities are more likely to experience uh, more socioeconomic problems such as less education, poor health outcomes and lower level of employment and higher poverty rates. And it's double the burden with children with disabilities. Due to current COVID-19 situation, especially the children and the person with disabilities affected badly. And with school closures, children with disabilities are lacking access to basic educational needs uh, such as assistive technologies, access to resource personnel, recreational programs and extracurricular activities at home and in the community. As public transportation system reduce or stop services due to COVID-19, so the person with disabilities, the children with disabilities who rely on those methods were affected badly because with our experience, we got to know some of our children with disabilities couldn't come to the clinic for their treatment or the follow-up because of this problem not having adequate transportation facilities. So that was another challenge they uh, faced during the COVID-19. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, UNCRPD, is the document which promotes the full integration of persons with disabilities in the societies. So that's why we always encourage and we always say that it's not charity, it's their rights. So we are focusing on rights-based approach and that's why as professionals, we always encourage, provide support to uplift their life for a better future. And that's their need and that's their right to have or right to access all their needs in equal opportunities. Let's move on to the case of Fatima. When I talking to the Fatima's parents, I found out uh, these type of needs. The first thing is to access to healthcare and rehabilitation continuously because uh, Fatima lives in uh, Athalugama in Bandaragama. As you all heard uh, during the previous COVID-19 wave, the Athalugama is uh, a village uh, who, which was badly affected and because of that Fatima couldn't come to the clinics properly. Actually she was defaulted and, uh, and currently now she is uh, going to a mainstream school and she studied in grade 2 with her same age students. So she has some difficulties in continuing some educational activities uh, on this new online teaching methods. And of course, she has transportation uh, needs as well, especially when it's come to the hospital visits. And for that, I think their family has uh, uh, problems in providing financial support. So they need to have additional financial support for that. And of course, she needs to have a barrier-free society to have equal opportunities to access to all her needs, especially the structural changes in institutions and organizations. And uh, when 
uh, we link all her needs with available resources from hospital to community care. Uh, it's important to see in three different levels. The first thing is the individual level. So when we take Fatima as an individual person, she has some specific uh, requirements to refer. So she needs to continue her treatment and therapies regularly uh, as guided by the hospital. So, so that uh, follow up uh, need to be arranged properly. Facilitate barrier free education to reach her fullest potential. Currently, she is studying at grade two, but uh, with the mother's uh, information and uh, assessments, we find out, we found out that Fatima is not competent as her same age level students. She has a cognitive delay, so we conducted a cognitive assessment and scholastic assessment, and there we found out her cognitive level is like four years of age and she could do only preschool level school activities but if we can educate the class teacher on her current educational abilities so she teacher could uh, support her in better way to achieve her educational uh, goals and that can be guided with individual educational plan to uh, improve her skills and abilities and also need to arrange some mobility facilities in the school, such as a commode seat uh, when she wants to use the toilet in the school. And need to arrange a transportation facility, especially when it's come to the clinic visits. So for that, we have to uh, arrange a transportation allowance uh, uh, after discussing with the social services officer in the divisional secretariat office, or if not, we can request a philanthropist whom we know who are working for the well-being of children with disabilities to provide them with the financial assistance. And of course, uh, we can request for a disability allowance from social service officer uh, uh, to uh, facilitate it for her. Family level, so that is another important level that we have to think of when we are linking all these services. As I mentioned earlier, Fatima's father is the laborer and because of that their poverty is high because he may not get uh, regular work. So they don't have sufficient income to maintain the family members, especially there are seven members out of seven, five children are studying. So they need to have additional financial support or we have to uh, find a solution by providing a fixed income generating activity or we can ask whether the mother is able to do a self-employment if she is uh, having some sort of a free time from Fatima. And of course, uh, we have to think of some structural changes uh, in the house, especially when it's come to the toilet training, she needs to have a common seat uh, in the uh, house. So for that, we have to arrange to provide a common seat to Fatima. The siblings. The siblings are the main assist in the family when it's come to the rehabilitation and inclusion. And of course, we have to think uh, in siblings' perspective as well, how they are coping up with Fatima's disability towards their well-being. Because uh, sometimes mother needs to accompany Fatima uh, at some hospital stage. As you all know, when it's come to the rehabilitation ward, uh, it might take sometimes weeks to stay in the hospital. So by during that time, to managing the household work and the educational work, it's a big challenge. For them, they need additional support and sibling them, they themselves need to train those skills to manage the household work as well. And another thing is most of the siblings, they complain about the financial commitments they have to they are in the family when they have a sibling with disabilities. 
especially a family like fatima their father has no fixed income so they always need to struggle with financial difficulties and uh, when we discuss with fatima's mother and also one of our therapist have noticed that the fatima's mother used to compare her with the twin brother uh, on uh, educational performances because fatima was quite behind of uh, fatima's twin brother so mother always used to compare her uh, educational performances but when uh, we saw her cognitive abilities we could explain the mother of her current educational level and then and there we need to guide her to support fatima in better way the most important thing is uh, in siblings perspective we always need to admire their support given in the family to look after the child with disabilities because they are very supportive to the uh, disabled sibling and that's where you accept your a uh, sibling with a disability and create a inclusive society for them now we'll see what is the community level so far we have discussed about the individual level family level and now we have come to the community level so community level means that fatima's future and how she has been included in the society so inclusive education can change her friends and family's attitudes especially we encourage the children with disabilities to uh, have their education in inclusive in inclusive educational setup and accepting her community uh, institutions for example fatima is a muslim girl so she is uh, going to a mosque for religious activities so in there she can be included and they may have social events uh, family events in there she needs to be included and also to have a strong relative and neighborhood support so which may provide additional support in her safety and security in the community last but not the least so according to the global liter literature evidence we know so uh, in cases with uh, disabilities managing uh, children with disabilities uh, well managing team work can give collaborative support for their better outcome and always link with the community workers such as social service officer social worker in the hospital but some hospitals they don't have social workers but at that time you can of course liaise with social service officer in the relevant divisional secretariat office and of course teachers we can't forget the teachers in providing inclusive education there are teachers who are actu actually supportive these children and providing accommodations in the school setup and religious leaders the community volunteers and all the therapists uh, and medical staff in providing holistic care in the hospital setting and also in the community because uh, we can't uh, achieve this target only providing all these resources in the hospital so that has to be widely spread into the community as well and also as a team we monitor the progress and follow up the care in the community to have a better independent life and finally our uh, ultimate outcome should be to create opportunities for a independent life so after fatima's education she could think of having a vocational training or an employment so that can be a self employment opportunity or, or if she is unable to continue her uh, life with her with her family she needs to have a proper residential care as well so leaving that note i would like to end my presentation and thank you for your active listening uh, have a pleasant evening uh, over to you madam hello uh, thank you very much for your informative presentation on team working cerebral palsy management so now time to open question so there are some question in chat box uh, 
I would like to uh, invite the presenters to answer this question. First one is, uh, do you have play therapies at LRH and they use in managing CP children at Lady J Hospital? Uh, can you repeat again? Uh, yes, madam. Uh, yeah. question, uh, first question is, do you have play therapists at okay. Lady Ridge Hospital and are they used managing CP children at Lady Ridge Hospital? Yeah, um, you know, ideally everything that the children should do should be through play. So that is what I encourage my therapist to do. There are uh, opportunities to do play therapy in our occupational therapy department as well as in the physiotherapy department. They have a nice outdoor area where they can uh, use um, uh, obstacle pathways and so on. So um, I'm encouraging them to use them as much as possible, yes. Okay, madam, uh, one more question. So is there a national program to improve functional performance in children with cerebral palsy? Um, national programs, uh, a lot of things are happening through Family Health Bureau. So uh, we are taking one by one. So currently we are working on early detection. Uh, we are laying down national uh, guidelines to uh, for early detection of at risk kids and then there will be uh, uh, it will be going in order because it's all you know a lot of work to be done so um, they we are thinking of modules to train you know um, in each uh, of the domains it, it is actually happening and it's at the initial stages but currently we are basically working still at the early interventional, early detection stage. It has to be, you know, um, there are a lot of work when cerebral palsy is concerned. We haven't uh, think of having a gate lab so far. So there are so many things. Um, uh, if I talk of the difficulties and lack of facilities, it's endless. Even the number of occupational therapists, it's a basic, basic facility that we should have. That's um, a big problem here uh, in our country. Only uh, batch uh, one, every other year, a batch of occupational therapists come out. And uh, we at LRH are struggling with numbers. So, I don't know what's happening in the other areas of the country. So we really need to go forward. Uh, we have a lot of room to improve uh, in the national policies and uh, you know protocols to deliver this care equal in all over the country. Yes, we have to work hard. And uh, I think many years to come, we will have to work continuously for that. Okay, thank you, madam. So uh, on behalf of the Sri Lankan Medical Association Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation, I would like to thanks again, Dr. Jayatri Jagoda, consultant in rheumatology and rehabilitation, Lady Ritchie Hospital, and uh, team, uh, Ms. Malika Jayatilaka, senior speech and language therapist at Lady Ritchie Hospital, uh, Mr. V. Tuar Gragan, uh, physiotherapist at Lady Ritchie Hospital, uh, Ms. Sumuduni Samsala, occupational therapist, uh, Ms. Posha Shering Tisera, prosthetist and orthotist, and Ms. T.H.R. Samanmali. So thank you very much uh, your contribution as a resource person. So uh, all of you have certificate for the appreciation for your valuable cont contribution. So uh, I would like to invite uh, Padma Madam to uh, hand over the certificate for the uh, Dr. Jayatri Jagoda, consultant in rheumatology and rehabilitation. So rest of the you will uh, collect your certificate from the SLMA. Thank you very much. So we have come to the end of the conference uh, in rheumatology uh, and rehabilitation today. So I think it was a very useful and fruitful experience to all of us being the uh, first uh, conference or the inaugural conference on rehabilitation. So hopefully we should be able to take it from there and have uh, more, uh, more topics being uh, discussed and more topics uh, being identified as a real need in the, the current situation. So I'm thankful to all the speakers who have uh, contributed with uh, really uh, 
excellent uh, talks and also uh, the, our uh, the staff uh, back at the back office, uh, Vihanga and the team. Uh, and actually I must really thank Dr. Padma Gunaratna for her brilliant idea in having this conference and all my fellow members of the expert committee in uh, medical rehabilitation for giving all the support and all of you who participated. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.